This is the setup instructions. Um, the URL is a bit small, but you can see it here. Uh, if you want to look at the README, you can go to the URL here. Uh, there's instructions for Conda as well as other uh, Python distributions to get all the materials uh, for your local machine setup. So uh, if you want to start doing that, if you haven't already, uh, if you have already, maybe do a git pull in case there are some updates. And then, yeah, uh, if you have any troubles getting the environment set up, I'll come around and help you out. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Uh, this is the Dax tutorial for those that have ended up in the wrong place. Um, uh, the text is probably just about legible to you. I'm expecting people will follow along on their own laptops. So ideally, you should have an installation locally if you've uh, followed the instructions on the readme that was sent out. Um, and you should get a JupyterLab instance running. It will look something like this. Uh, you will have files here. This is the first notebook of the tutorial uh, introduction. Um, I don't seem to be able to make the text much bigger than this without it looking funny on the screen. So uh, if you have trouble, then maybe Tom will. Tom is uh, here to help out. Um, raise your hand, and hopefully we can get around to each of you. Uh, there will be a fair amount of talking to start off with, so plenty of time to get things up and running. Don't worry, if you're having trouble, uh, we'll get around to everybody. Also, there will be a cluster that we can jump to uh, as soon as it's ready and everything's working fine. And if you are having trouble with local installation, then the cluster, well, we'll be using it all together later anyway, so uh, people can transition to that if they need to. Um, for those people that are not used to uh, the notebook interface, there is code and text in here and the outputs of code. So we will be running through and executing things as we go, and you'll be able to see the outputs within here. Um, we will be running through a set of notebooks and demonstrating Dask from the ground up all of the things, hopefully, that you're interested in. At any time you have a question about why did it happen like that, or what's going on? Just put your hands up uh, for a general question to the room, and I'll answer. If you have a more specific problem like, hey, something's gone strange on my particular machine, then uh, try to get the attention of, there will be a couple of us in the audience uh, look, going around helping people. OK, any, any questions or comments before we get going? No, I hope everybody stayed dry. OK, so um, the notebooks will have this common format. Um, this is what a code cell looks like. This is ordinary Python. So you can enter things in here. Like if I put in one, then it evaluates one, and the output is one. Should not be too surprising. And there will be frequent exercises, which will say something like, hey, write some stuff to do with whatever we've just been talking about. And then these cells, starting with a load, which will get a pre-prepared solution for you once you've given up or you want to compare what you've done with what we think is a decent solution. So in this case, the task is to have Python output hello world. I hope everybody knows how to do that. But just to demonstrate, you would load the solution. And oh, look, you say print hello world. If you execute this, and you can do that by shift and enter which will execute and move on, or control and enter, which will execute and stay put. And here we have hello world. OK, um, I, I hope everybody is, is happy with this um, format. So I will move on. By the way, this is running locally. If you, uh, you should not have all of these weird things on your main screen. So just ignore that for now. Um, I will move to the first notebook, and we'll actually get going. So now we'll be talking about Dask. Um, you will all have heard about Dask, and you're here to find out how to use it. So there is a function in Dask called delayed. It is, in some situations, the only thing that you will need to know about Dask. And you can use it to trivially parallelize all kinds of arbitrary code. So here we're going to. Uh, 
demonstrates uh, some simple things with delayed. And um, in breaks, maybe we can talk about how you can use that for some of your own code. Also, for those that are interested, there will be a birds of a feather session on Friday, I believe, for people who have had some experience with Dask to talk about that experience. You can come along and see how other people are using Dask. And also on Saturday, Sunday, there will be a code sprint around Dask if people feel like they want to contribute something because of what they've learned here. I'll be repeating those at the end of the session, so you don't need to remember them now. OK, so let's get stuck in. Um, here is some ordinary Python code. This is simulating work. In fact, it's doing something very trivial. Here we're going to add one to the input. Here we're going to add together two inputs. And there is a sleep command in here to make it seem as if something is really happening. OK. So now, if we're going to add one to one, and add one to two, and then add up the two results, because each of these functions has a sleep in, this is going to sleep once, sleep twice, sleep three times. It shouldn't be too much of a surprise how long this takes. Three seconds. Um, this again, I, I won't point out the features of the notebook. I, I expect that people generally know this, but in case you don't, this thing at the top of the cell just says measure the time it takes to do whatever is in the cell. In this case, three seconds. And Z will be the output of 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 1. So. Um, the delayed function, which is also a decorator, is a way of getting Dask to execute things in parallel for you without having to worry about how that actually happens. So there's a single function, dask.delayed. We're going to import it. And now, instead of calling ink of one, we're going to call delayed of ink of one, and so on. For each of the Two functions, we're going to call delayed and then call it on an input. And Z has the output of that. Now this ran and it took basically no time at all. And the reason is that this thing Z is not actually the output. It's a prescription of how to make the output. And I'll demonstrate what that means in a moment. To actually execute the, the, the code here, the thing that Z prescribes, we call dot compute on it. So this is now actually going to run the work. It's going to call ink twice, and it's going to add together those results. And this takes two seconds instead of three seconds. The reason is that back here, the two calls to increment are completely independent of each other, so they can be run at the same time. OK. To demonstrate this, so I already mentioned Z is this, this weird thing that contains, it remembers all the things that we wanted to compute. And we can, in fact, look at how that is. Um, there is I'll raise a warning here. This thing, um, let's just make that smaller too, so that you can see it. Um, not everybody will manage to get this to show up, because the program that is called in the background to make this show is a tricky to install. So don't worry about it. It's a nice feature, but it's not important to actually making Dask run. You can see what I'm doing at the front. Uh, we can sort out installation problems around GraphWiz later. I don't want to get bogged down in that now. Uh, if you run it on the cluster, it should just work when we get to the cluster. So you can go back and run these. And everybody can get GraphWiz running eventually. It's just a bit tricky. Anyway, this is showing we have two functions, ink, and they're going to produce two results, ink 1 and ink 0. And we're going to pass them both to add, and then we're going to have a result of add. It's trivial to see from this that these two things down here, this processing of the ink function, can happen in parallel, which is why it took a shorter amount of time. Any questions about what happened there? I know it's early, and probably the coffee hasn't quite sunk in for everybody, but we want questions. We want discussion. <laughs> yes? For something like, uh, seemingly trivial like this, um, is there really a big difference between what Dask is doing here and, say, if I did a similar thing maybe with Numba? Uh, did it with? Numba or, or some other parallelization? 
Uh, I don't want to talk about number because that's actually really complicated what that does in the background. Uh, but if you wanted to do this with a thread, then that would be totally fine. In fact, Dask here is using a thread pool. It's just providing a, a convenient syntax around making that happen. And really, the point of Dask is to take away that pain of having to write your own parallelism stuff, uh, because it scales from trivial computations like this to rather complicated things. OK, so um, we can have some more discussion in a moment, because I'm going to introduce you to your first real exercise, which is we're going to have some data, a simple list of numbers like this. So let's execute that. Now we have some data. And we have a sum of 1 plus each of those. So we're going to take the numbers in turn, add one to them, put these numbers into a list, and then we're going to call the built-in function sum to add up that list. Um, because ink contains the sleep statement, again, it's going to sleep for each of these. So I'll set this going, and it should take eight seconds. And it's running in a single thread, obviously. So it takes eight, eight seconds plus a bit for actually calling some and other things. And the result is 44. OK, so uh, you've seen delayed. You're going to need to call it in some way. And I know it's early, but just a little touch of thinking should get you there here. And if you get stuck, then there is the solution that you can look at afterwards. And I'll give you actually 10 minutes for this to try out a couple of things. The result should be 44, and it should run in, in less time than 8. How fast it runs will depend on how many cores you have on your machine. In the meantime, further questions or well, anything. Any thoughts? Has anybody succeeded? A few hands. Are some people still working on it? Nobody. Some people given up? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> OK, so I will show you the solution. Um, it would not be surprising from what we've seen that you should probably have a delay of ink. That's going to feature here. Now, how many people? also did a delayed of some. Most people. OK. So uh, the, solution looks, the solution looks like this. So uh, ink has simply gone to delayed of ink. And some has gone to delayed of some. And nothing else has changed except to actually get an output you need dot compute. So if we run this. I uh, should time this. The output is 44, as before. And it runs in one second, because I have eight threads available on here. Uh, so all of the ink statements ran in parallel for my case. For your case, it might be different. Now, what would happen if some was not delayed? It still works. Now, any guesses on why that is? So if we look at um, total, <coughs> it looks like this. We're doing eight completely independent things. They produce rep um, results. They all go into this one function called sum. In other words, sum actually gets a, a, a list of numbers to add up. If I take away delayed here, did anybody try this? OK. This gets a bit crazy. OK. So what's going on here is the built-in implementation of sum works by taking the first two things and adding them together, and then taking the next thing and adding it onto the result. Delayed objects like this are clever enough that if you, if you do delayed thing plus one, which in this case they were um, all called a y, these things, if you do the first y plus the second y and they both happen to be delayed, then Dask realizes this and it produces a delayed third thing that is those two things added together. So delayed objects, you can do lots of the normal things that you do with Dask objects 
and they will still remain lazy. They won't get evaluated. They'll just remember all of the things that you've done to them. So down here, we have the result of the first increment. And then we're, we're doing a, a, an implicit add on it with the output of the second one, and then more implicit adds as the built-in Python function is building up the result. So this is OK. Um, it's obviously better if you do the previous version. It's not better in terms of execution time, but it's more obvious what you're doing here. Something that is delayed, if you pass it delayed things, then the function, when it gets run, sum, will actually get those things, in this case, the numbers. So I'll put this back to how it was. OK, so uh, a little more involved now. Um, the reason delayed is so useful and gets around some of the problems and quirks of working with threads and processes and things that people might be used to is that you can, A, just add them together and expect Python to do the right thing like that. But also, you can involve logic in there and decide what to do. So um, here, I've, I, this is called flow control. And here is an example, just to run straight to it. So we have something that is called double, again, simulating some work. And it's just going to do two times the value. And we have another, which is called is even, which it will give true or false, depending on whether x divides cleanly by 2, and some new data. And now we have a slightly more complicated computation in which we're going to go through our data, and we're either going to double it, or we're going to increment it, and then we're going to sum the results up. So this is running sequentially in a single thread. So again, it should take uh, eight seconds. Or a bit more. Um, and then we're going to, again, do the same thing. We're going to parallelize this using delayed. <coughs> and the question is, which of the functions here do you want to apply delayed to? Off you go. While you're still working on that, I will show you the solution. And I hope that you will come back to this in the future and try a few different ways of doing it. As soon as you have more complicated processing patterns, there are often different ways in which you might apply delayed. And it's going to depend on how fast each of the individual functions work, whether you want to delay the whole thing or delay parts of it, whether they're independent. Uh, it does require a little bit of thinking about. In this case, it was not that complicated. So. Uh, the clue, if anybody noticed, was to delay things with sleep in them, because that's where the work is happening here. So we want that to um, happen in parallel. So we delay this double it function, and again delay the inc function. We did not delay is even, because we want to decide which of the heavy functions to call. Calling is even takes essentially no time. So there's no point in delaying that. And we actually need the result of it in order to know what to do. So if we call delayed, we would have to compute it in order to know which of these two paths to go on. So there were, there's, there's no point in doing that. But we can delay these once we've made the decision. And we can, again, do the same thing as previously, append the results, uh, de <coughs> delay the sum, and now we have a total. Um, the result was 90, and it took 10 seconds. So now it takes two seconds, and the result is 90. Again, now we have something that is pretty trivially parallelized again. We have, uh, where well you can see, we have some ink calls and double calls, and there's an equal number of them, because even numbers are as common as odd ones. So there are some questions here I already alluded to. Uh, we mentioned delaying some on what happens here. Uh, and I, the actual logic of your 
problem, won't delay easily in this case. Um, but in general, you should read up on uh, delayed objects are rather flexible. You can do lots of things with them. Um, so there's documentation on that. And then finally, on here is a, a slightly more uh, involved example. So uh, for those that haven't already done so, if you run this prep data file, uh, this will take a while because it's going to prepare some fake data for all of the exercises in one go. If you've already run it, then running it again like this won't take any time at all, which is good. Um, so set that running, and it could take actually up to five minutes, I think, to run through. Um, meanwhile, I'll show you what is here. Uh, you don't need to do anything until your data is ready. Oh, I am running some. OK. In that case, this will take a, while, a little while for me to. <laughs> I just saw this, but that was the first trivial part of it. OK, so uh, what's happening here is that um, there's a data directory, and it's being populated with various things that we're going to run through uh, for the different parts of this. And in order to make Dask interesting, this is a problem that we have to deal with all the time, there's not much point in parallelizing something that runs quickly, right? So instead of putting sleep statements in everywhere, um, we're going to actually deal with some rather large data. And the first one of these is going to be some, um, some uh, CSVs. OK, they have arrived, which are um, flights out of New York City. There are uh, three airports there, and lots of flights for every year in the 90s. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with how a CSV file looks. We're not going to look at them yet. But we know if you've ever used Pandas, and I, I expect most people here have at least seen it used, Pandas is good at reading CSV. And it does it in a tabular fashion. So here is here are some, some rows from the first of those files. And you see there's lots of details about each of the flights. So, um, so flights on the very 1st of January 1990, so that's when the data starts, with some times, uh, departure, arrival, whether it was late, what the carrier is, et cetera, et cetera, lots of stuff here. And we can look at what kind of data this is. Again, don't worry too much if you're not a regular Pandas user. There will be a section of this tutorial dedicated to Pandas-like functioning. Um, Depending on the kind of, I, I guess lots of people here are actually scientists at SciPy, depending on what you're doing, uh, pandas can be hugely useful. And Tom here is a core developer. I'm not. Um, OK, anyway, so uh, this particular data you see has many, many um, columns, and each one of them has an associated time. Most of them are numbers. Some of these, like the one that says, uh, Object here is they're actually strings. So a string in, in Python is a is a type of object. So there are a few of those. Okay. If we now this is uh, if you remember one of the files only. I can hear some some uh, laptop fans going. So other people are preparing data too. <laughs> um, and. Cal computations with pandas for something that is sitting in memory is really fast. So pandas is great um, if you can fit your data in memory. Uh, you can, for example, do this. What are all the unique origin airports in this case? Uh, so these are the three New York City airports. And we can do various pandas-like things with them, which are sort of, if you don't know pandas, you probably do know SQL. So this is a SQL-like thing. I'm going to group by this, these three and look at the departure delays and get the means as a function of those groups. This runs in essentially no time. But what happens if you have a lot of files? So uh, there were 10 or 11 of these, I think. And we want to do the same thing, but we want to do it for all of the years. So we're going to do this thing, this, this group by thing, and we want to add them together. In fact, we want to do some kind of average. So we're going to have some 
sums and we're going to have some counts so that we can do a mean afterwards. Um, the sequential way to do it, and I'm sure you've all done this kind of uh, computation in the past, we're going to loop through the file names, we're going to load each of the file, we're going to do the group, and then we're going to take the sum, and we're going to take the count, and then we're going to add up the sums and add up the counts, and then at the end we're going to sum the sums, sum the counts, and then do a grand mean. Which should take a few seconds. The time here is actually being spent in loading the data, not in adding it up. So it takes seven seconds-ish, and here's the totals. So uh, it seems that it's best to fly from here for those that have visited New York. I don't know. OK. Um, and we're going to go through how you would parallelize this. Again, this is closer to the kinds of things that you would actually do in your day-to-day -day work, handling data. And here it goes through um, some of the things that I already mentioned, that these delayed objects can do lots of things. So once we have a delayed object, then we can do things to that delayed object. So here we have a um, built-in add, we have an item selector, and we have a method call on it. And if the thing that we started off with, which is just x here, is delayed, then everything here will be delayed. Y will be a delayed object too that encodes all of this. OK. Uh, second, there is this dot compute that we've seen, because we've only ever had a single output for each of the uh, computations we've done so far. However, often computations share some common elements, and it's wasteful to have to, for each output, compute those shared elements. So there is also a dask dot compute that you can call, and you can pass it multiple th delayed things and it will compute them all at the same time, and shared things will only be computed once. So there's, there's a big savings to be had there. OK, so uh, we already, I think, imported that. And we need to, again, there will be a solution here. We need to apply delayed. And this is the last of your delayed uh, exercises. So give it your all. We need to delay the running of this thing such that it's much faster than it was before. And again, you have options on how you do this. Uh, the solution follows. And the answer is this thing. This is what you should get out. If there are people who have not yet succeeded in running things locally, there is a cluster which is now running again, because, you know, Obviously, it would break just before people arrive, in case you didn't know what we were whispering about. So uh, this is the IP. Again, run things locally if you can. Uh, we'll be switching to the cluster later when we're demonstrating some real distributed, larger scale computations. Uh, this IP is available if you need it. The login is your uh, anything. Actually, you can just choose a username. Try to you. you choose something that's unique to you so we don't have people stepping on each other, so uh, nobody use one, two, three, four. Do you want me to do data frames then? If you feel Take like a it. break, sure. I don't mind. Is data frames next? Um, array. Arrays. Yeah. So you can do arrays, I'll do data frames. Okay. Cool. Okay. While you're working, I'll tell you a little bit about this cluster. Aside from the fact that occasionally it breaks, which we think is down to Google and not the infrastructure we wrote, uh, <laughs> it's really nice that you can set up uh, an auto-scaling Jupyter Lab-based thing in well, 10 minutes, so, I think, um, with just a few commands. There is a thing called Jupyter Hub. That is the front end where you log in, which when people get to it, in this case, has no security, but it could have. So you might care about that. And each person then gets their own unique Jupyter server within which you have your own unique workspaces. And as you'll see, it's trivial to set up uh, Dask clusters 
which are several virtual machines that their containers within the same fra uh, framework, which are unique to your workload, so it's isolated from everybody else. So if people are looking to teach Dask or want to make a scratch cluster for people to try Dask with reasonably heavy workloads, the, that kind of work, um, it's a very nice way to do it. There is a public use one called Pangeo, which is made for general scientific work. It's, it was created by a team that focuses on planetary science, um, including meteorology, for example, uh, earth imaging, that kind of stuff. So real science involving real data. And uh, people go on there all the time, and they do heavy workloads using Dask, and they produce results, which is uh, very nice. And anybody can use it if you have something that seems somewhat legitimate. For the time being, there's plenty of money. Eventually, they'll have to tighten it up. OK, uh, getting back to this, so we'll finish off the delayed section. Um, I hope people have some kind of idea here. I will show you the solution in which we have delayed one function and nothing else. So the, we started off this particular section saying by, by saying that you can do lots of things to delay things, and they remain delayed. So that was the hint. Also, I hinted that typically you end up delaying the things that actually take time. In this case, that's the reading. And you don't need to do anything else. So um, to actually look at that. There's your output. How much time did it take? Oh. Uh, okay. Now it completed it immediately. Oh, sorry. Thank you. So it took a factor of three-ish faster, a bit less. The reason it's not a full factor of eight faster is because everything is being read from the same disk. So you will often find you have bottlenecks somewhere along the line, whether it's your disk or the network or, or even the display in some cases, uh, as you'll see in the array notebook, which is next. OK, any questions on delayed? Uh, there are lots of things you could do. You could parallelize those things that is even needs and then got the result there and then did something based on it. And then you're keeping the logic in the in your session, in your normal process. Or you could form a function which inlines all of those things yeah. as well. And which you do will depend on, on what exactly it is. Yes? Uh, in the very first yeah. call, we didn't actually evaluate anything. We just declared that it was delayed, which makes this graph. Uh, no, no, sorry. Then the second, there's a for loop and there's uh, like eight numbers, and then you do a time the sum and then you do a parallelize for loop. The first of four loops. Not this. Uh, yeah. This one? You delayed the append? Yeah, yeah, I don't know what's the reason. Uh, you probably didn't evaluate anything. <laughs> well, we can, I can look at that. <laughs> uh, it's quite common in delay-oriented things like this. A very typical workflow is that you have a bunch of input files. You're going to do one thing to all of them. Then you're going to do another thing to all of them. Then you're going to combine the outputs or maybe write all of the outputs to another set of files. Those things really work very nicely with, with delayed. And 
you use it typically with arbitrary functions that you have lying around. You don't want to change those functions to make them more dasky. So you can delay them and hope that, that they separate out the logic nicely enough for delay to be able to do a decent job. Um, maybe. This might be big, though. Where is... Oh, here's my computer. So we have two things here that we could visualize. Sums which is, oh, sorry, that's the, yeah. oh, we overwrote them, okay. So, uh, not immediately, one second. So now we have this, this list of delayed things. And we, so it's a list of delayed things. We can visualize any one of them. And it's fairly straightforward because we're reading, then we're grouping, and then we're getting something, one of the uh, columns, and then we're summing it up. So these are completely independent paths for each of the files. Are you next? Okay, in my version, I didn't use uh, Dask Compute um, for some, I didn't do the uh, combination sums and counts compute, and then I'm taking about the same amount of time. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm assuming it's just uh, the kill. Um, multi-threading being uh, saturated. Uh, but the question is, it looks like the savings also comes from um, read CSV uh, not being called multiple times. So is the assumption that compute is able to read the graph and figure out that it gets... Yes, yes, exactly. So the sums and the, the uh, count both depend on the same underlying data, so that data is only being read once in this case. And then uh, the saving is from read CSV itself, the passing of the text is quite CPU heavy. So the loading you don't really save on because it's coming from the same, the same um, IO source. Um, but on the passing of the, the text, that does run in parallel. You can't tell the difference, but that's what's going on. No, I'm just thinking that's amazing. I don't have to like, think about like, um, storing or caching. I, I hope it's amazing, yes. <laughs> there was a question. Yeah. yeah. I was just going to say, is there any particular difference between doing the compute on sums and counts and delaying the sum on each of them individually? Uh, there is not in this case. This was, it was really, uh, sorry, where is it? This line was to demonstrate that you can share the inputs to the two of these in, in the call. If you had done some on them or delayed some on them and then this and your final answer of mean could have also been delayed and then you just compute that would they would have been fine that, that's what takes longer it takes longer for it you takes longer if you don't uh if you don't call compute on sums and count counts it will read the csv for, uh, for each file for it would read the csv if you it would if you had done separate calls yes. on each of them, then it would take longer. Yeah. OK. We will move on. So how many people in the room would consider themselves to be scientists? This is for my curiosity. In more than half. OK. I used to be a scientist. <laughs> Now I just pretend a bit. Um, my particular science was astrophysics. I used a lot of arrays in that time. Um, I never used pandas for research, but people love it. So uh, we'll get to that in a moment. First, we'll talk about arrays. OK, and we're going to get to this kind of concept here, this image. Which is, you know what a NumPy array is, even if you're using pandas, machine learning, whatever high-level tools, you'll know what an array is. It's a bunch of numbers 
of the same type that are laid out in a nice way in memory so that you can do things to them in a very optimized way. NumPy is great, um, but NumPy at the very best can handle memapped to arrays sometimes, but really you want to be able to chunk up your computations so that you can do um, higher order things to them. For data that doesn't fit in memory, you also get some speed up if you, uh, depending on the kind of computation you're doing, if you can run it in parallel. And finally, what we'll get to later in, in the tutorial, you can spread your data out across a cluster so that you can fit a lot more in memory than you would have thought and actually be able to do things to it. So um, Dask has a way of accessing chunked set of NumPy arrays as if it was a single NumPy array and it will feel the same, it will work the same and in many cases it will just work with something that doesn't fit in memory and it will just make things faster, faster in the common case. Now it is parallel and there's lots of magic going on in the background so uh, maybe we can touch on some cases where it doesn't do what you would like. Um, so the overview is like this. This whole block here is supposed to be a two-dimensional Dask array in memory. And we can split it up so that each of these smaller pieces is an actual NumPy array somewhere. Maybe it's a NumPy array that needs to be loaded yet, or it's a NumPy array that resides on a different computer, or however it is, Dask will, will do that marshalling for you. But um, you can understand that you can process an array in chunks and then uh, view the whole thing as a single logical array by doing that. So we're going to demonstrate some of these things if what I said wasn't too clear. Um, but first we'll look at the idea of, of chunking up your computation in general. This is the kind of thing that you might already be doing before using Dask, perhaps with threads or perhaps just in a for loop because the data is too big to hold in memory at once. Uh, so we're going to make a really big array and we're going to add it up. Okay. Um, if you ran the prep script, then you will have some large file on disk called random. And it is made of random numbers, as the name suggests. And let's see, I should find out how big it is. It's four gigabytes. So it would fit in memory, but maybe not so comfortably, depending on how new your laptop is. OK, um, so if we want to add this thing up, then uh, this th happens to be in an HDF5 file. There are lots of different ways of storing data on disk. HDF is pretty common in scientific contexts. Um, and what we can do is this thing called dset is pointing at the file, but it's just metadata. You can access pieces of the data like this using normal NumPy um, indexing. And we can make sums on each of those bits and do a usual thing, keep a set of sums, add the sums up and print the total. So this takes a little while to page through four gigabytes of stuff on disk. And we're having to load all of that. At some point we'll have to load all of that anyway. It completes in a few seconds. The trouble is um, what you would normally do is load, if you're thinking about NumPy processing of things, you would normally say, oh, I have a whole load of data on disk. I want to load the whole thing into memory so that I can do NumPy-like things to it. Here we're doing a sort of roundabout way to cope with that. We're saying I'm going to load some pieces of it. I'm going to add up those pieces and add up those uh, subtotals to make a grand total so that I don't have to burn away my memory. <coughs> okay. Um, we, I don't think I will ask you to actually do this exercise. It's pretty trivial. Um, since we can do sums, we can do other things in a similar chunk-wise approach. So the, the sum of each block, the length of each block. In this case, we actually know. We, we provide beforehand what the length of each block is, so this is kind of silly. Um, but you could imagine having to do this for calculating mean. 
and then we're going to add them all up and we're going to make a mean. So I'm just going to show you this, this, is, this is not Dask, right? This is just how you might have done things in the past. And then I'll show you that Dask can do this for you automatically. Um, again, you page through these pieces, um, you add the sums, you get the sizes, you accumulate all these pieces, you add them up, you get a grand total. And I, I believe the total should be about one, yeah, because it's random numbers that are normally distributed about one, I guess. Um, but Dask has an array module that does stuff like this for you. In particular, we're going to create a dask.array, and we're going to use this function. Uh, if you look in the dask array, a dask array is usually abbreviated DA. If you look in the dask array namespace, you will find a lot of familiar looking things from NumPy, like uh, zeros, ones, random, that kind of thing for generating data. Uh, there are some ways of loading data also. Um, pro possibly the simplest way of loading data is to use this thing called from array which takes an object that supports NumPy syntax, which, as you already saw, these HDF5 loader objects do. So when you, when you do that, it fetches some of the data. And that's exactly the kind of thing that from array expects. You can also give it an array if you just want to play with how Dask array works, but you probably won't be winning very much there because we already know that NumPy itself is fast. If you can fit it in memory without worrying about it, then maybe um, you don't need Dask Array in those cases. So we say that we're going to load from this object, which points to the file on disk. And the only thing that we need to tell Dask is how big we would like the pieces to be. This is a one dimensional thing. So we provide a single number for the chunks. Uh, you can chunk in each dimension, like the uh, diagram further up the page showed. And we'll have, we will operate on real NumPy arrays, and we will do NumPy-like things to them, and we will not know that they're being loaded successively from disk for us. Okay, so here's a demonstration. Some, this is what we started off with, with the for loop. So here, if we call, um, if I execute this, then x, is this array thing? So it just tells me it knows the D type, it knows the overall shape, and it knows the chunk size. But it's just an object in the usual way of Dask, and we'll come back to this again and again. It's a lazy thing that points to the work that is to be done. It, it is not in memory, it's just the prescription. When we call sum on it here, then we get something else. This now, it's another array, but it has a name aggregate. It has a shape of, of nothing because it's just going to be a number, but we do know that it's float and because it has no shape, it has no chunk size. And again, you see the themes coming back to actually make this happen, we call compute. And there's our answer, which is the same answer as before. This is the sum, not the mean. The mean is one, I think. Um, so it's very convenient to be able to just call dot sum, not have to write for loops to pass through your chunks, but that's really what's happening in the, in the background. Okay, so uh, I jumped over the trivial, how do you actually compute the mean? Because there's a really, really easy way to compute the mean of a Dask array, and I hope that everybody can do it in 10 seconds. I'm counting. You may notice that you have this, this convenient autocomplete. All of the things on, almost all of the things on here are typical NumPy methods that you expect to have on a NumPy array. And they should look pretty familiar to you. So what would mean be called? Okay. It exists, we can call it. Okay, but it, it produces one of these, right? So what you need to do when you have some, some uh, dasky object that you would like, want to know what it's actually worth rather than how it's made, you compute it. And it's one, as it was before. 
Okay, so uh, now this was doing two things to each of the chunks. Actually, it's calling mean on all of the chunks because NumPy already knows how to do mean. But imagine that it's doing a sum and a count on each of the chunks and um, getting the total of all of that. Okay, um, a bit of, a, of an aside, uh, NumPy is good at, at um, not holding the gill. We mentioned the gill before. If anybody doesn't know what the gill is, we don't need to talk about it now. But uh, NumPy works fairly well with um, running things in threads. Uh, NumPy is fast anyway. Uh, obviously, Dask has some overhead for whatever you're doing. So something that would be really fast in NumPy, you don't want to bother. But for many things, if they're like this, and they're heavy on memory, or they're actually really heavy on CPU usage, then it's often worthwhile calling the Dask version of whatever it is that you would have been doing in NumPy. Okay, so we're going to go into uh, an example here. This is using an in-memory uh, data set. Again, another random number. So um, we'll be looking at some real data shortly in case you're bored of these. Uh, it's difficult, as I say, to come up with useful examples that actually look like look impressive as if they're doing something, but are big enough to make a task interesting. OK, so what, what we've done here, this is, again, the Dask array version of random normal. The only difference is that we provide a, a size, as you would do for random normally. And we also provide a chunks so that we, we specify how we would like this to be split up. And you can do things like this to it, which shouldn't surprise anyone after what we just did. So you can take the mean, you can say which axis, you can do some, some selections on it. Now, the total size of this, again, is similar to what we just had, three, three and a bit gigabytes in this case. And if we want to compute this mean and selection thing, this, this, will, you know, this will parallelize OK. It will take three seconds. It's actually generating the data, too, when it's do doing this. It's not loading the data like the previous one. It's generating it both uh, quite fast. Um, but it did need to consider all of the, this is 20,000 by 20,000, so you know it's a pretty big thing. And it did um, means along one of the axes, and it did some selection, and there's your output. So a bunch of numbers. Let's um, get rid of this. OK. Now, we're going to talk about this rather than do it. Um, you can experiment at your own leisure. So uh, first of all, it's, it's good that uh, we don't have to create this thing in memory and then do NumPy things to it, although we could, certainly on this laptop, um, on all laptops that you might have bought within the past few years. Uh, but NumPy takes a while because it's running in a single thread and it needs a lot of memory to do it because the whole thing is in memory at one go. Uh, Dask says it should have taken four seconds. How long did it actually take me? Three. OK, close enough. Um, Dask in this case is faster and it takes a lot less memory because it's working on the, the chunks independently. There are quite a few chunks here. OK. So, uh, so there are some questions here, and uh, these are actual questions that I'm going to ask you. We could have specified different things to chunks. Uh, remembering the overall size was 20,000 to 20,000. So um, any idea? What would happen if we said this? NumPy result? Does people be the same as NumPy result? It would run exactly the same as the NumPy version, yes. Because one of these chunks would have been all the data. You would only have one chunk. And really what Dask is doing is calling NumPy. So it would make this one chunk. It would call a NumPy thing on this one chunk and get the result. So it would incur all of the time and memory overhead of having the whole chunk and working on the whole chunk in one go. There would be no parallelism because you only have the one chunk. So in some ways, Dask is, is kind of stupid. It's not going to automatically split things up without you saying something about it. One moment. Um, and in fact, Dask will only add some overhead to it. Not very much overhead in this case. It would run essentially at the same time. Yes? So I'm using Dask, and so my question is, uh, in, when you have NumPy, you have also OpenAPM, you can invoke OpenAPM as well. You know, where you have threading, where you call the threading from the 
Mm -hmm. Uh, it is possible to oversubscribe threads, yes. So if you're depending on Dask because you want to have the out-of-core, low-memory solution to whatever you're doing, then you may want to restrict the number of threads that... Th there are actually a few things that use threads together with NumPy arrays. Uh, you may want to restrict them to one thread to, so that they're not competing with each other. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, if all that you want is parallelism and there's already something that you're using that solves the threading problem for you, then in those cases where it fits in memory, maybe you don't need to switch to Dask. So it's a, a choice. Uh, second question, what happens if we set this chunk size to be rather small? Yes, I didn't see who said that, but yes, it's, uh, that's quite right. So in this case, the time spent on calculating the uh, sum and size of each of the pieces is very, very fast because NumPy is an optimized thing. And the overhead associated with Dask's part of deciding which to call and setting up all those things becomes important. And it, uh, so the total amount of time taken will be much higher. Another way of thinking about it is that the total number of chunks, and therefore the total number of function calls that this will involve will be massive. And each of those function calls requires some time to happen. Uh, there is a minimum time even for the simplest of computations. And so the, the total time taken will be very large. Also the graph, so the prescription of how you go about doing this computation will be very large, and the graph itself will take up a lot of memory, which is something that it will take a lot of time to create and take up a lot of memory, which is something that people often don't think about, but it's worth keeping in mind. Okay, um, if you run prep, then this should run very quickly. I'm going to demonstrate some real data. So again, this is HDF5 data in this, this folder called WeatherBig, which is, I believe, actually rather big. Again, let's find out just how big. So this is 17 gigs, which uh, doesn't even fit on this laptop. It may fit in the memory of a, a real um, workstation, and we can do things to it, like we can subsample it, get, um, get one of the subsets of data and subsample it, and if we do that, then we can actually make an image. So, oh, sorry, this is just the first few elements, so that's fast. But if we actually want to read the whole one of one of these data sets, and subsample it so that we can make an image out of it, otherwise Matplotlib would choke. But this still takes a while just to create an image out of one of the pieces of the data set. So this gives you an idea that this data now is, is fairly hard work. And it looks like this. So this is uh, temperature. Um, we are in this, this hideously hot place somewhere over here. So this seems to be the winter, so it was, I, I suppose, clement at the time. Okay, um, so here's your actual Dask Array exercise. The first one, uh, make an array out of the set of data sets, and we will be using the from array function. So go ahead. In a moment, we'll be making a single array out of the set of arrays. So you'll end up with one array per input data file. These things, uh, D sets, were the file names. Oh, sorry, they were the open file pointers, these H5Py things. We'll be having a break in 10 minutes so that you can all get coffee and snacks before they take them away.
actually to that end, I won't leave you waiting on this one because we already saw the solution essentially. This call from Array on each of our um, HDF object things, uh, the request here is to have a chunk size of 500, 500. Don't worry about the particular numbers that you should be using here, just, just take those. And we're going to do it for each of the uh, certain number, actually, I don't remember how many of these there are, for the certain number of uh, data set objects. And having done that, we'll have these things. So now it's just a list of Dask arrays. And the second part of this, that was quite a few of them, about 20. The second part of this is we're going to look at a new function, stack, which does this, stack an array along a given direction so that we have an overall aggregate array of those arrays. The only thing that you need to worry about here is each of these arrays, you see its shape, it's that size. And we would like, sorry, it's 31, apparently, 31 of these files. We're going to stack it such that the overall array has this shape when we're done. Given the uh, call signature here, I think it should be fairly obvious how to do that. I'll give you a moment. And keep asking questions if, uh, if you have anything. And it should look like this. So the thing that we made conveniently was a list of arrays. The thing that da.stack needs is a list of arrays. And there are 31 of them. And we're told that we're going to need something that's 31 and the rest of it. So axis 0 is the direction in which we want to stack this. OK. And now we have this thing. So this is rather, this is the full 17 gigs being referenced as a single object on which you can do normal NumPy things. And it will, anything like that will be computed chunk by chunk from each of the set of files in a way that you don't need to worry about how that actually is achieved. Uh, computations will be in parallel, but you still need to hit the disk. So things will run slowly. There are a couple of exercises here. I think this is a good time to break so that uh, you can refuel. Um, I would like you to try these exercises, possibly get some coffee and then try the exercises. And we'll start again at about half past. There's a data frame scheduler, distributed data frame, distributed advanced. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And of machine those, learning, we never get to the end. Yeah. That's, that's the answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we get there. Uh, is there something that you want out of that? I honestly don't think we'll get there even if, well, yeah. four hours is too long. I don't yeah. think we'll. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we can talk about it. Uh, so it's dask, github.com slash dask slash dask dash tutorial dash infrastructure that has the setup and then all that'll like point you towards Pangeo, which is the project that did all that. So Yeah, if you do search on Pangeo, just Pangeo? Probably. Yeah. Pangeo data. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's a fair amount of information there on how you would go about doing your drone yeah. if you don't want to follow our specific yeah. setup. Ours is very specific to Google Cloud Platform, which is where it's all running, but if you have like an HPC cluster or something, then there's... Okay, perfect. Yeah, so I would go straight to Pangeo uh, data, and there are people who've done it on a bunch of systems. Um, yeah. yeah, and most of it is Jupyter. Yeah. Really, that's, that's how this works. So yeah. have you had any direct 
code on, in that? Uh, no, no. Uh, it's just configuration of JupyterHub. So it's, it's nice. <laughs> So if people would need anything. Oh, uh, yeah, one person is asking. I think you got it. You're good. Uh, so yeah, you can go yeah. back. Okay. Uh, the IP of the cluster is up in front of you in case uh, you're having some local troubles. Uh, some people seem to have had corruption in their HDFI files for some reason. It's not very important. You can go back and recreate them and redo this at your own time anyway. Um, as people are filing in, I will uh, show these which are fairly straightforward. Um, but I don't think I'll actually, well, all right, I'll run it. This takes a little while. So there are two things here. One of them was the mean along a particular axis. The axis here is between data sets. They're uh, um, at separate times. I actually don't know what the time scale is. Don't ask me about the data. It's just pretty. But showing to you people. Um, so this is reading through all 17 gigs again, and it's doing sensible things with the chunks so that uh, it can create an average without having to load all of the data into memory at once. Because there's quite a lot of it, it takes quite a while. Even rendering it onto the screen takes a little while here. So that, um, while that's going on, I can keep chatting. And then the second one of this is going to be difference between the mean, oh, so now it's ready to show it, and then it shows it. Okay, so this is the mean, and then you can see that uh, at this particular time, Australia was extremely hot. And then if we want the difference of one of them from the mean, then we can just do something like this. This result is also a dask array. Uh, you, when you call compute on this, which uh, you notice actually uh, we're not explicitly calling compute. It just so happens that imshow tries to convert whatever it's given directly into a, a NumPy array. That's something to keep in mind that there are functions out there that will undaskify your arrays. So keep that at the back of your mind. Um, so if I set this running, this is taking, is, is doing a NumPy like thing to our array. It's resulting in another Dask array. And then when we compute it, it's again sharing intermediates, all that good stuff, working chunk by chunk. <coughs> so that when it's done, we'll get a, uh, well, another image that won't look that different from this, but it's just to demonstrate that you can do several things in a very NumPy like way. While that's running, I'll uh, introduce the next bit. We won't actually run this exercise. We'll get on to uh, data frames. Yes? Is there a way to visualize the task graph executing, or at least some of the processes? Yep. <coughs> it will be very big. First, I'll have to wait for it to compute. You can do this uh, if you have graphics running, which we, we didn't get to yet, um, then, ah, here we go. OK, so um, on this particular day, or whatever it was, uh, compared to the overall mean of this data, it was very cold in Canada and hot in the Gobi Desert. I, I'm guessing. I don't really. <laughs> there aren't any borderlines on here, so let's say that's where that is. Let's see if this actually renders. We have a very many pieces of this, because the, the chunk size was moderately small. So um, we'll see. This might fail. The final part of this is going to be, uh, so if we make this, we can also store it. This is something that you will commonly want to do. Uh, HDF5 is, uh, again, typical format. I'll also like to mention a data format called ZAR, which I, I personally like very much, which is very convenient for working with Dask because the individual data pieces are stored in separate files. Um, so it works very nicely with storing your data to remote services like S3 um, and accessing it in parallel with Dask. So um, I encourage you to look that up. Not many people use it, so it's not very good as a in data interchange format, but, but maybe it's uh, convenient for you. No, I don't think this is going to complete. 
yeah, um, so it's too big. <laughs> uh, there are limits to, to what uh, graphics can do. Uh, it is just a, a, a Unix utility. It probably would have visualized, OK, we'll get onto the um, distributed scheduler. And it comes with its own dashboard. And that also visualizes graphs in a rather more simple fashion than what GraphWiz does it. I'm, I'm sure it would have shown up OK on there. OK, this is quite long. All right, so um, I'll, I'll go through the, the rest of this notebook quite quickly. So uh, yes, you can store these. And I'll just show you the code of how you would do it. And it's essentially just calling dasgray.2 hf5, and you're going to give it your result that you make before. This is some, the exercise asks you to do some subsampling, so this is simple subsampling. Uses all of the data as input, but only writes out every fourth pixel. Uh, 2 hdf 5 you give it a file name, and it goes. And you don't need to worry about the chunks or anything like that. It's all handled for you. And then the final part, which is actual physics. Uh, here is the physics. We have some um, 1 over r to the 6 and 1 over r cubed. This is a particle-particle interaction. Um, if you're not into physics, that's fine. Uh, the, the, the point of this is that uh, it takes a while because if you have lots of particles, then particle-particle interaction has to be between every single pair of them. There's quite a lot of them. Uh, so the, the basic, the, this is a value of the potential energy of the system. Don't worry about it. That's what it is, you can believe me. And it takes this long. And if you run this, which I won't bother now for the sake of time, I think I'll just wrap up this array stuff, you will notice that of all these functions that are required to actually um, compute this value, the thing that takes the most time happens to be this one, because we're doing some kind of fancy NumPy things to calculate the set of clusters here, set of clusters there, and find the, the pairwise um, differences between all of them. That is the distances between every pair of particles, which you then use to calculate the potential. So that's what takes the time, and uh, that's the bit that Dask will want to parallelize. Okay. And to do it, the only thing that we need to do is again, the cluster is our input, it's an array. We turn it into Dask array by saying from array. We assign some chunks. Uh, in this case, we're explicitly saying chop it up into however many CPUs we have so that we can run those separate chunks all in parallel. Uh, they're all independent of each other. And uh, this runs in a fraction of the time. It was five and a half seconds. Here it's one second. So good speed up there. Um, and some general text about when Dask Array might fail. I read, leave this for you to read again. Um, there's a lot of detail here if you have array heavy workloads, then I encourage you to read this in detail. Of course, the documentation has a specific array section to it that you should look at. Um, part of the reason that this is complicated is because there are already many optimizations under the hood, um, some of which use CPU-wise tricks that when you split the data into sections, those tricks go away. So it's possible to have worse performance in Dask than it would be in something that is heavily optimized to knowing how to handle your CPU cache or something like that. OK, so I will stop there and hand over to Tom, who will take you through data frames. Were there, before I close this, any last questions on arrays? Uh, benchmarking is always a good idea for whatever you're doing. Uh, the rule of thumb is that the time to process each chunk should be significant compared to the desk overhead, which on the, the simple 
thread-based scheduler that we're using here is of the order uh, hundreds of microseconds. A couple of, it's, it's small, but NumPy is fast. Um, another rule of thumb, if you're doing something that is memory heavy, is you don't want, but be, whenever you do something with NumPy, you tend to have intermediates created as you go. So whenever you add together two NumPy arrays, you usually have some temporary array that you fill in with them. So um, if you have several threads that are running, eight typically, or something like that, uh, if each thread has a chunk, an input chunk, or multiple input arrays that it's working on, each of those will have several copies. So it's worthwhile to have things of the order 100 megabytes is a, is a, a good place to aim for so that you don't run out of memory while you do these things. Also, it depends in which direction you mean to do your computation. So if you're taking means or whatever it is along particular directions of your array, then uh, it, it can make sense to set your chunks that way. Sorry? Is there a way to directly specify chunks in terms of half uh, there, there is recently a, a magic rechunk which will aim for a, a, a target memory size. So, so yes, there, there is such a thing. Um, in most cases, though, you know the data type that you're dealing with, so um, you, you can figure it out also. There is the startup chunks to thing like random does already support that. Mm -hmm. I think so. It did go a little bit through. Yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure that we just put it in so that uh, we were using random here. The chunks parameter there, you can have um, auto in there. So you need to, sp you typically need to specify something. Uh, don't just leave it completely up, but it could be interesting to see what automatic does for you. Uh, yeah, NumPy itself is already a C extension, and so yes, anything that Python can do, Dask can do. The things that you don't want to do is alter the values of arrays in place. Um, generally across Dask, most Dask things expect you to give an input, produce an output uh, separately, and generally speaking, you should always try and keep away from mutation in place. Uh, no, what happens is that you delay the Python function that calls the C um, code. Okay, so we'll move on. All righty. Uh, so yeah, so if everyone wants to get the third notebook opened up, uh, talking about data frames. I know Martin asked this already, but who here has used pandas? Okay, I like to see that. Uh, that's great. So uh, yeah, so this is another collection. So we saw a Dask delayed, which is a way to take your own kind of custom code and get it working well with Dask, uh, get it paralyzed, building up these task graphs. Uh, we saw Dask Array, which is one of these high-level collections like Dask Data Frame that kind of does that Dask, that task graph building for you. Um, so we'll see another thing where it feels like pandas, only it's doing these kind of delayed task building stuff that you come along later and compute stuff in parallel. So same idea. Okay. Um, great. And yeah, so when do you use Dask Data Frame? Uh, you know, Pandas is still great. Uh, and if your workflow is fits well on a single machine, your data uh, isn't larger than memory, then continue to use Pandas. Uh, there's probably not much of a reason to use Dask uh, if you have a, an in-memory data set that fits on a single machine. Um, if you're doing stuff with strings, pandas is really slow with strings, so maybe uh, Dask can help out there. But uh, in general, uh, Dask is useful when your data set grows larger than memory. Um, okay. 
So we'll do our usual imports here. And uh, so this will we'll import DAS data frame as DD instead of PD. Uh, and most of the things in you know, DD dot in the DD namespace is going to look like pandas. Uh, so there's like, you know, two date time, things like that. And then this is going to make a DAS data frame. And that has most of the same methods as pandas, uh, pandas data frame. Uh, one thing to call out here is that um, you know, Dask is all about operating in parallel. So whereas pandas read CSV takes a single file, Dask data frame will take a, uh, you know, a, a list of files or a glob string uh, pointing towards a list of files. Okay. Any questions on that? All righty. And then again, just like uh, Dask Array uses NumPy to do the actual computation, uh, Dask Data Frame uses pandas to do the actual reading of CSV, parsing the text, uh, all these various things. Okay. So uh, most things in DAS data frame are going to be delayed. Uh, one of the exceptions is df.head. It's useful to be able to get a concrete result. So this computes immediately, and we can see that this DAS data frame structure, uh, you know, is we have our a bit of info about the columns, about the data types. Um, but then if we want to actually look at some data, we can call df.head. Uh, and this takes a bit of time because it actually has to start reading some data, parsing it, and so on. And then we get our first five results here. We're on the next cell, and we get an exception. Um, so I think if you scroll down to the bottom here, there's some intermediate DAS code here that's a bit ugly. But if you go all the way down to the bottom, you'll see this nice little uh, uh, exception message here telling you is, is exactly what went wrong. So we have this collection of files. Uh, CSV files don't have types associated with them, so pandas just tries to infer. Uh, Dask leaves all that to pandas. Uh, and we run into the situation where the inference for the first file uh, inferred something different from the uh, pandas inference for the last file. So we get this type mismatch. This would happen if you were using pandas by itself. Uh, only Dask is checking it for you. OK, so how would you solve this with pandas? Provide the type. Yeah, exactly. So pandas has a dtype keyword, um, which we'll scroll on. Oh, yeah, so, it's a, so the exact error is that, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a fun one. Um, there's a couple for like this first one. Uh, pandas doesn't currently have integer uh, NA support. So uh, pandas marks missing values as np.nan, which is a float. If you have a column of integers and one missing value, it's going to become a column of floats. Uh, this is being worked on soon. Uh, it may be merged today, actually. So uh, optional. Uh, but yeah, it may be merged today. Um, anyway, so for now, uh, we, we just have to deal with this by saying, oh, this column, you know, it's actually floats since there are missing values. Maybe there weren't any missing values in the first set, and there were some in the last one, and that's what messed it up. Uh, similar sort of thing here. So we'll just be explicit about our dtypes. Okay. So we'll specify these exactly, and then uh, tail will now succeed. This is uh, important when you're working with multiple sources of data where you want to basically um, you know, remove all the inference, because that can very easily go wrong if you have multiple files or switch to a better file format. OK. Uh, all right. So Earlier in the Dask delayed notebook, we saw an example. Um, I think we're going to do the exact same thing, uh, um, only using Dask data frame now. So usually you won't use Dask delayed and Dask data frame together. Uh, typically, it's one or the other. You might use Dask delayed to do some pre-processing of your data. You know that's very you know special. Uh, for your data set, uh, and then convert it to a DAS data frame from there. But once you have a DAS data frame, you're not going to be delaying functions on it. OK, so in this case, we want to uh, compute the maximum delay over the entire data set. Um, so we can go ahead and run that. Um, you know, again, just like uh, Dask Array, most of the methods on Dask data frame are going to match their pandas method, only they're going to be uh, lazy. They're going to have a delayed result. Okay. So uh, I think this is in minutes, seconds. Uh, yeah, I think it's in minutes. That's a long delay. Um, OK. So this would be the delayed results, uh, dd.scalar. We know it's a, a you know, single value result that we can then compute. Any questions on that? Yeah. 
Okay. Interesting. Um, hmm. If you change this, uh, was it canceled? I assume uh, that canceled this uh, this column. You could try int here. Um, right, you're on a Mac. That's strange. Um, I mean, that's coming directly from pandas. Yeah. Yeah. It could be. Um, you can check that with. Uh, have we imported PD? Whoops. You can check your version. I'm on 0 0.23. Um, that could be. Um, otherwise, you could try changing this to an int, which will mess up things later on. So you do something like uh, df of uh, canceled equal to df .canceled as type bool. This might work for you. Yeah. I have no way this parent is working. It may be uh, encoding if any yeah. text editor has touched it. Could be. Could. You could try this as well. So change bool to int, uh, and then as type it. That might work. Might not, but worth a shot. So I mean, you can see, you know, desk data frame. This is how if you if you had this issue in pandas, you would solve it exactly this way. Same thing with desk data frame for most things. All right. Anyone else having any troubles? Uh, I'm gonna change that back to bool. Um, and just to see what Dask is doing here, same thing, we have this visualized method available on all the delayed results. So uh, the IO, there's uh, some number of files here. I'm not sure how many. Um, and all the IO can happen in parallel. So, well, you know, depending on your disk, uh, if you had multiple disks, it'd be even better. But uh, it could, in theory, happen in parallel. All the parsing of these bytes into actual uh, uh, you know, stuff that Pandas does into a data frame, that can happen in parallel. And then there's a bit of uh, intermediate uh, maxes that can be taken. And then you take the max of the maxes. And that's, uh, yeah, that's your result. Only. So this is again something you could do with a bit of effort by looping over the files and then having like an intermediate uh, list of maxes and then doing the max at the end. You could do this yourself. Uh, it just gets tedious doing that for every pandas method. All right, let's do some exercises. Um, first one, uh, actually we have like four or five, five exercises here. Um, I think we'll give uh, you know five to 10 minutes to go through all of these, and then uh, we'll walk through them as a group uh, in five to 10 minutes. So uh, if you're familiar with pandas, hopefully these are also the same way. Um, yeah, as you're going through these, ask yourself, OK, how would I do this with just pandas? And see if it works. <coughs> if you have any troubles, uh, raise your hand, and Martin and I will come around and help you out. There's a question earlier about the return type of, uh, you know, like, when I, whenever I do dot .compute, what's that going to be? Uh, so in this case, if I call df.compute, what type is this going to return? Pandas data frame, right. So it's going to be like the in-memory counterpart of whatever it's, uh, you know, uh, standing in for. Uh, so if you have like a big dask array, dot .compute, you're going to get that back. Uh, so, so this would be, you know, a large-ish, I can't remember how big the full data set is, but this would be the full data set in memory. Uh, so you always have to be careful about that. Typically what you do is do some operations on this to filter it down to something that does fit in memory and then compute on that. Okay, so how many rows are in our data set? Uh, how would you do this with pandas? There's two ways, probably. You'd do shape. This would uh, not give you what you want. Uh, it's going to shortly have uh, a shape attribute. Um, this kind of hints at um, an issue with Dask data frame. I'm not sure how best to say it, but uh, what's, I'll talk about it in a second. What's the other way you would do it with pandas? Length, yes. So we'll do len df. You notice that this takes a bit of time. What do you think is happening right now? Yeah, so we're, 
having to remember dash data frame is lazy. We just have like these kind of you know tasks to do. You, you know, at some point in the future, when I require it, read in the CSV, parse it into a pandas data frame. Okay, so we're doing that uh, when we call len. So dash data frame doesn't know like statically ahead of time how long your data frame is to compute the length. It actually takes some time. You have to go through your entire data set, which if you think about it for like a CSV, there's no way to tell how long a CSV is without actually reading it, right? Some storage formats do write their sizes, uh, like Parquet, you can get to that, but for something like CSV, there's no way to tell ahead of time. Um, that contrasts with something like Dask Array. Um, here's the auto we were talking about earlier. We make this uh, large Dask Array. Uh, computing the length of X is immediate. So Dask Array does know its length most of the time, unless you do something like uh, you know, x of x is 0 greater than 0.5. At this point, um, that doesn't work because, I don't know why. We'll ignore that. Uh, x, of, x of 0, whoops, what shape is that? Greater than 0 0.5. So this has a shape of nan. It's, it's unknown at this point, because we don't know which of these values are actually greater than 0.5, so we've lost the shape. Most things in Dask Array will keep their shape around, so we're able to tell ahead of time. With Dask Data Frame, we, we don't know that, because most of the times with pandas, you know, you're working with CSVs or some of these file formats, or doing these kinds of operations that don't have a, a guaranteed uh, length attached to the result. So something to keep in mind. Uh, in the future, df.shape will return, uh, you know, like np.nan and then len of df.columns. There's a pull request that does this right now. Okay, uh, Boolean indexing. So, uh, number of non canceled flights. What did people do here? Boolean indexing, we're going to have, uh, first of all, let's do df.canceled is the column that we're looking at. Um, this is, uh, we'll take a look at the first five rows. It should be a Boolean. And with pandas, you can pass that into that. So this filters it down, and then we can compute the length of that. And again, uh, this is you know, having to read the data in at this point. Read the data in, do the filtering, and then do the length computation in parallel. Questions on those first two? Uh, I believe so. Whoops. Sorry. Thanks. You could also do that. Yep. <coughs> if you do the sum, though, it's um, a good point. What is this going to be? Okay. So that's going to be a. Uh, oops. Sorry. Um, uh, sorry. Not this. Df dot canceled dot sum. What is this going to be? a delayed result, at which point you'd have to compute it. When we interact with like Python, uh, len is always supposed to return an integer, so that's why it's immediate. Len should not return a delayed result. OK. Um, group by. So you know, if you think about it, computing the length of something is, you know, uh, computing the length of this you know, delayed thing is pretty easy to do. You, know, you compute the length of each chunk and then sum, the length, sum those lengths. Uh, something like group by, you have to do a bit of thinking about if you're going to try and do that on your own. Um, but Dask has done it for you. So in this case, we want the number of non-canceled flights uh, per airport. So with pandas, we would say df.groupby, uh, what is the, is it capital A? Or origin? It's origin. Yeah, origin. Um, and then we'll say the, um, I think uh, pandas, anyway, we'll filter it down. Uh, df.canceled, tilde df.canceled. Uh, and then we'll group that by origin. And then we will take the count of that. This will do it for each column. Let's see if that works. Yeah. Let's just count some column like, uh, no, I don't. You can't put canceled because you're grouping by origin. Gotcha. Anyway, 
uh, we'll compute the like this. Or I'll just load the solution. Origin count count. I thought I tried that. Martin. <laughs> Min length must be positive. That's a strange one. Uh, I'll look into that later. ACA. Yeah, uh, pandas is supposed to do that. This is like one of my least favorite parts of pandas API. It's like you're repeating origin, um, but I'm just gonna do it my way. Uh, so we'll group by origin. Uh, there's too many ways to do stuff in pandas. I can say that, I'm allowed to. Okay, uh, so size is the uh, number of non-nulls, I believe. So yeah, depending on which one. So um, I believe it's the number of non-nulls. I could be wrong about that. Yeah. Why can't you use um, df.origin in the group by function? Um, you're saying? Uh, the object, uh, df.origin. Say here. Do you have thought origin? Uh, group by this? Yeah. Uh, does this work? So I think that's the same as pandas. Whoops, I lost my place. Okay. So these are equivalent uh, pandas operations. You can pass a key to the column or the series itself. And yeah, I'm not sure what the error is. It's in pandas, so. Uh, it's a dastatorial, so I blame those pandas developers. <laughs> the size that three was the, the number of entries. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. Could you, you could phrase this with value counts, right? Wow. Well. Um, yeah, probably. Oh, yeah. And I think we'd drop an A by default. Yeah, yeah. Lots of ways to do stuff. So, yeah. Any questions on that one? Sorry. Sorry, the solution didn't work. Okay. Oh, it did. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Whatever. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, so. It has to be a new version of Pandas that's done that. It's got to be. We did, uh, we've had two releases in the last four days or something, because apparently packaging is difficult. So, and there's still an issue with C++. So, um, let's see, what was the average departure delay from each airport? So, similar sort of thing. In this case, we will, I think, use uh, uh, group by. And I'll hit in the same error. I don't know why that would be. I love <coughs> pandas. Yeah. I don't know. I honestly don't know. But see, so this is a this is doing a data frame group by. This is doing a series group by. So uh, those are different code paths in pandas for some reason, and this is not broken. So if you're having issues, maybe this will work, uh, and I'll file an issue after the tutorial. So. Yeah. I yeah. Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I do not know. But uh, yeah. Any questions on that one? And then the last one, uh, day of the week. Uh, so there's uh, in pandas. How do you get the day of the week of a date time? Uh, we're we're looking at uh, uh, what's the column name? Yeah. Ah, yeah, there's, makes things easier. So we'll take a look at this. This is a zero through six day of the week, or one through seven, I'm not sure. So we'll group by that, whoops. So we'll group by that uh, dot depth, <laughs> depth delay, uh, and the average, okay? So that's the laser result, and then compute that. 
So if you're familiar with pandas, hopefully this feels uh, you know, the same, same uh, only the computation will be happening in parallel. It is I like, one, two, seven. I, I, I like this one. It says don't travel on a Friday. And, uh, <laughs> most people might know that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All righty. Uh, so every time we've done these examples, let's, let's think about the first two exercises. Compute the length of the entire data frame and the length of the, the number of non-canceled flights. Uh, there's a lot of re redundant work between those, right? We had to read the entire, uh, all the CSVs uh, for both of those computations. If we wanted to compute uh, both of those like at the same time, we can, there's a lot of shared, uh, shared com intermediate computation there. So similar sort of thing. Uh, when you're working with Dask, uh, deciding when to compute is an important question to answer. Um, or it's an important thing to think about. So in this case, we're going to build up some, uh, some results. So selecting the non-canceled flight and then getting the mean and the standard, standard deviation of the uh, departure delays for the non-canceled flights. So these are lazy delayed results. Uh, and if we do those uh, sequentially, we're going to have to recompute everything that's shared. So all of the reading from CSV, all of the filtering. If we were to use a single call to the top level das.compute, um, all of that intermediate computation, which takes up the bulk of the time, is going to be shared between the two. So you get a slight speed up here. Well, a large speed up since it takes basically all the time. Does that make sense to people? It's like a very important but very subtle thing to think about when you're using Dask. This, this whole delayed computing is like a completely different mindset. Okay. Alrighty. If this works, you'll see that basically this is all fused uh, or shared between the two. Alrighty. So uh, earlier on, I said that DAS data frame does not know its own length, unlike DAS array. Uh, that kind of uh, comes down to the uh, DAS data frame data model, where the idea is that you, you have uh, a data frame-like thing, a table that's partitioned along the index. So pandas has an index. It's you know, very important uh, for lots of operations. Dask uh, has index as well. Uh, and, and in addition, it keeps track of the partitions of this index. Uh, so this can be important when you're thinking about, like, how do I get quick lookups? Uh, if I wanted to select all the flights for, for February 2016, there's a couple ways you could do that. You could filter, uh, do like a filter. So select the, there's like a departure date column, uh, give me the ones where that's uh, equal to February. Um, and that would have to scan the entire data set and then do the filtering, uh, which would take you know a while. There's another way to do it. Um, ah, we, we need to make the date times first. So uh, if we look at df.cscrs step time. Okay, these are in some weird formats. Um, I think this is like, uh, hour in the first two, and then minutes in the second two, if that makes sense. But they're currently ints, so we got to do some work there. OK. Um, right. So <laughs> yes, so this is a, an example of uh, how to use uh, that pandas has a large API, like we've discovered. Das doesn't cover all of it, uh, because that'd be insane. So if you, if you do need a bit of pandas API that isn't implemented yet, how would you do that? Um, so here's an example of uh, something that uh, used to, uh, we used to not have a, a DD.2 date time. We do now, because we've fixed that. But uh, suppose we didn't have a DD.2 date time to convert these to date times, what would you do? Um, so in this case, uh, you know, how would you do it with pandas? And then we'll see, um, we'll see how to do it with Dask. So this is pandas. Uh, we're going to take a, a look at date. So our, our goal here is to take uh, this. We want to get the departure uh, date time, so the date and the time. So we have the time here in this weird format. We have the date here, and we need to join those two together. So how would we do that with pandas? That's here. So we're going to uh, do this weird stuff uh, on the, the depth time. Not super important, because this is the only data set I've seen where it has this weird uh, hours and minutes in the same format, in the same field. But um, So we're going to uh, truncate this 
uh, run down by 100, and then uh, called two date time on the hours, and then two date time separately on the minutes, uh, on the, the, you know, the second two digits, and then add those two together to get the actual uh, you know, hours plus minutes from, from midnight, and then add that to the date. So this is a date plus a date time plus a date time, uh, sorry, a date plus a time delta plus a time delta, which gives us a date time. And that's how, so we're doing this on the first 10 rows with, that, uh, with pandas. And this is the actual time that it left. If that didn't make sense, uh, apologies for going too fast. We're going to do the exact same thing in Dask now. Okay. To do that, we're going to use, um, you know, we could, now that Dask has a two time delta, uh, we could just change this PD to a DD and things would work fine. Uh, this exact same code. Uh, let's suppose that you didn't have that because uh, it wasn't implemented. You'll, this will happen when you're using Dask data frame. Um, you, know, you go, you file an issue on, Dask, uh, on, on the Dask GitHub repo and say, hey, uh, could you implement this? And we can probably do it quickly. Uh, but in the meantime, if you want to work around, um, you can use map partitions. So we can take a look at this. Uh, this takes a function to apply to each partition of our Dask data frame. So we have our Dask data frame here with these various blocks here. Each one of these is basically a pandas data frame. So this is a pandas data frame, this is a pandas data frame. And if you're doing operations that uh, you know, operate you know, independently on each block, you don't need any cross-block communication, cross-partition communication. Uh, for example, to date time uh, just operates on each scalar element and returns the same size thing. That's a date time or a time delta. Uh, so that's a good example of what we can use with uh, map partitions. OK, so we're going to map PD .time to time delta over each partition of ours. Let's break this up. Nope. Yeah. I don't know how to control. There we go. So hours time delta, we haven't really done anything yet, but Dask uh, data frame knows that we have a time delta here. And then we'll do the same sort of operations here with our minutes time delta. So again, we have a date. Um, date time plus a time delta plus a time delta, which gives us a uh, date time. And at that point, we can actually compute it you know, in parallel. Okay. Questions on that? Go back here. So the key takeaway there is uh, you're going to come across things that are not implemented in DAS data frame yet. Uh, for many of those cases, uh, map partitions is going to enable to you to take your normal pandas workflow and adapt it to Dask so that it runs in parallel and out of core and all that. All right. um, that's slightly inefficient because we do these two uh, separate map partitions. You can fix that up if you wanted, uh, but I think we'll skip that in the interest of time uh, to get on to a more interesting topics. Schedulers. Martin, do you want to do this one? All right, so schedulers and then. Yeah, I think I think it's running. Um, think it's okay? Oh, yeah, I haven't checked. Uh, I okay. forgot to. <laughs> but I, I think so. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you'll do schedulers, I'll do data frames? Mm -hmm. and, then, data frames. And, and then I'll, I'll be back. Data frames. Yeah, perfect. And I, I still don't think we'll get to number seven. I don't think so either. Okay, okay we are back. <laughs> So uh, into some more juicy, exciting Dask stuff. Uh, thank you, Tom, for uh, stepping in and uh, taking the place of Jim today. Um, he'll be back with distributed data frames, which is data frames but bigger shortly. OK, so um, now I'm going to talk about schedulers, or schedulers, if you prefer which is uh, we've been executing some stuff and it's been running in parallel and Dask has some magic to make that happen. Here's a nice little diagram of some computation. And Dask 
the scheduler is handed one of these graphs of whatever it is that you want to compute, and it takes some logical decisions about what to run when, how to pass intermediates from one task to the next, and how to basically turn all off this red so you get that your, your final output at the end of this. I think blue ones are ones on here that have been computed and already forgotten about because they're no longer needed. So DOS cares about getting stuff finished and out of memory so that you can run more stuff. It cares about running things in parallel. It cares about all of the things that you would like a parallelism framework to do for you. But there are some options. So in this notebook, I'm going to talk about the options available to you. First of all, uh, we've been running things locally, which was the original use case for Dask, which is that you have your computer, you want to be able to use all of its cores, and you want to be able to compute against data sets that are larger than your memory. And for those things, it runs very efficiently, and it's splitting the, the work into um, threads and processes. Um, we have these things. This is the old nomenclature. Um, we'll show you how to use these and how to use the, the new way of doing things. Um, but basically, there are some functions, oops, sorry, some functions called get. And these are the ones that, given a graph of stuff to do, will go about executing them and giving you back an answer. And you can see there are three built in local ones. These are executing in separate threads executing in separate processes, or executing in a single thread as if you were running everything sequentially normally in the notebook. This last one might be a bit of a surprise. Why does Dask have that when the whole purpose of Dask is to parallelize things? Well, it's really good for debugging, obviously. So you can, uh, if you have an error, the first thing that you usually do, an error beyond the typical things we saw with data frames where you need to change types or something like that, where you really don't understand what happened and you want to run the debugger, that won't work if your uh, tasks are being executed in a separate thread or process. So this exists for that. And this get keyword can be used in, in various places. But um, as we'll see, um, in a moment, there are some examples of this, but uh, I'll show you that there's a, a new, easier way of doing this. So first, the demonstration, and then I'll show you the, the new way. So this is the same, same thing, again, as we've been dealing with, because we don't want to swamp you with too many data sets, in which we're going to make a, uh, a largest delay. And let's just see, does this compute, or do we need the thing? This does compute. <laughs> Okay, maybe I should have just timed it. So um, there's your answer. And this takes a few seconds, obviously. And it's using threads in the back, uh, uh, background to do that. Uh, that is the built-in default. That's what happens unless you specify it otherwise. And when it's doing this, it's opening some files, it's loading some files, it's passing them, it's evaluating this Boolean, it's filtering, it's selecting a column, and then it's uh, taking maxes of each of the data frames and then combining them. So that's all of the work that's going on in the background. That's quite a few tasks. And it, well, I don't know if you think this is fast or not, but we did see some examples using uh, sequentially a set of pandas data frames, and it's faster than that. Now. If we want to run this on processes instead of threads, and you can see the, the nice handy, so the version Dask version has been updated, but not all of the code, but this is interesting, um, saying that get is perhaps the older way of doing this. I'll show you in a moment what the new way of doing it is. Um, so now we're using processes to do the same thing. And we'll immediately notice this has already ran for more than six seconds. Any thoughts about why that might be? Why why would it be doing that? Um, like, uh, you have more files than you have CPUs available. Yeah. So, it's so it's still going to be running uh, eight processes, so one per core. And each of those processes will be running one thread. So it's not, not overloading the CPU in that sense. But what is happening is that 
we have dependencies between the various parts of this computation. So there's a lot of communication between the processes that's going on. Whenever you have data that's passing from one process to another, it's going to need to be serialized, uh, sent across a pipe or, or something, and then deserialized at the far end. That's one definite cost that you always have associated with processes. Another cost is starting processes is slow, especially if you're on Windows, which I don't think too, there's, there seems to be mostly Macs in here, but some of us might be on Windows. Uh, Windows process startup time is particularly slow. Um, and also you need to communicate with the processes from the scheduler, which in this case is, is running within this process. So all of those add overhead. However, some computations will only run well in processes if they use the GIL, in which case threads won't help you. Okay, and then the final one, this is running things sequentially in the current thread of the current process, so it's not actually doing anything in parallel. It does still give you the memory savings because it's still working chunk by chunk as, as much as possible, and you see it's actually faster than multiprocessing to run things in a single thread. And that's a clue that in this case, there's a lot of serialization and communication overhead. When you're in a single thread, you don't need to do that. When you're in threads in a single process, then normally you don't need to serialize anything. You, you just pass a reference to the mem memory. Okay. So, um, rules of thumb that you always need to think about when you're hoping that something can be parallelized is what's the maximum speed up that is possible at all? This will depend on your number of cores, how much work can your CPU be doing at all, and it will depend on the graph of what it is that you're doing. It should be somewhat clear from the graph itself, if it's small enough to display, how much parallelism, how much completely independent work there is that you can do. And then, there's a question between threads and uh, how much speed up you can get will depend on whether the GIL is released for threads, and for processes it will depend on how much communication needs to happen. Okay, uh, We're not going to read this, but you can read at your leisure. There's a, a lot of discussion of this kind of topics. Um, I did not show you how to do this now, though. So I'm just going to show you one of these. <coughs> so instead of having to pass around these get functions, having to import them in the first place and then having to pass them, you can use special keywords that do the same thing. So this is a usability enhancement. I hope you like it. So uh, there are quite a few synonyms in here. I think this full name of this is is uh, single threaded or something like that. I just use sync because it's the one that I remember. Uh, the other options are threaded and multi and processes or multiprocessing. Those are both the same thing. Uh, and and yeah, that's a slightly simpler way of doing this. Um, you can also set what the default is, and we'll get to that in a moment. However, um, these days, the default is nice, the default threaded thing. We've used it throughout, and we've seen a lot of nice speed ups and nice behavior. It's not necessarily the default anymore. It's the one that you'll get unless you do anything else because it has uh, fewer dependencies, but there is now a thing called the distributed scheduler. The distributed scheduler does not need to run in a distributed way. You can run it on a single machine and get benefits from it. So I'll show you. This is the easiest way of setting up a uh, distributed cluster. That is a cluster that's using the distributed scheduler. You just call client, and this will by default set up eight processes and a distributed scheduler to run them. Uh, there are a whole load of optional parameters that can go into here, so you could have chosen two processes, each with four threads or, or, or whatever. You can set various memory limits. There are lots of bonuses in here that uh, we won't have time to go into, but maybe I can show you a bit of a flavor. Uh, one thing is that we have this cluster object, and most of the 
ways of setting up a cluster come with one of these. You'll see the uh, Kubernetes one in a moment when we run on the uh, cloud cluster. And you can change the number of workers you have dynamically as you go. Also, you get this rather nice dashboard, which if you've seen any of the Dask talks, then people like this a lot. It's really helped with the popularity of Dask. There's nothing here to see yet. You can see that our eight processes are, are taking up a half a gigabyte of memory amongst them. There are quite a few panes of information here. Uh, this is information that's not available using the built-in threaded or multiprocessing schedulers. You can get some of it with some effort, but here it's provided as, as a bonus. Okay, so um, since we now have a cluster, a, a distributed client set up, if you make one of these, then it will become the default without you doing anything else. Uh, by the way, you can also actually connect to something that's truly distributed if you, uh, whatever IP it may be in here. If you have a cluster that's been set up for you, or you have the means to set yourself up a cluster on a cloud provider or on your local hardware, whatever it may be, then here is where you would put the address of the scheduler to connect to. Again, we'll get to that shortly. So now, if I compute this thing, things happen over here. Stuff happens, which is really nice to see. And when it's done, here we have a result. You'll notice that this is the fastest that we've seen yet, which might be a surprise because this is using processes, in fact, so there's communication going on. But the distributed scheduler is the next generation scheduler. It's much smarter about making sure work happens where the data already is so that there's the minimum of um, communication between the processes going on. And in fact, you can see like this, we skipped over it rather quickly. These are all the tasks as they happened in here. So we started off with some um, read things, and then we have some pandas passing stuff that's going on. Those are the, the biggest blocks here. And then we have the actual getting items, grouping, and all the rest of it. The red pieces here, those are communication. So there is occasionally some communication going on, but there's very little of it in total. Any questions there? That was quite a lot of information in a short amount of time. Yes. Yeah, there are eight here for the eight cores of the machine. If none of what is displaying? Oh, this thing? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, OK. Then you are missing IPy widgets. Um, it's fine. It won't, it won't matter. You don't need this. I'm not actually going to use it. Um, if you ran the standard notebook instead of the JupyterLab notebook, then maybe it works because the, the, you need the extension to be built. This is from the, the standard um, environment. Yeah. There is, there is a, um, a command that I won't be able to remember. That is the Jupyter Notebook extension to install it. Um, if you if you look up Jupyter Lab and IP widgets, IPy widgets, then um, it will tell you how to do that. You'll need to restart the process for it to work, though. Sorry about that. It works on the provided cluster. So <laughs> that one was set up. In any case, this always works with any luck. OK, and it's, it's fast, as I said, which is cool. Sorry? Yes, yes, so this will come up at uh, localhost 8787 slash status. If you don't have the status, then you'll have um, an, an, an index thing, and it's the status one. Most of these you'll never use. They're for special cases. But uh, the status one you'll use all the time, and actually it has some of the information is duplicated on here. Tom? 
Do you remember the MB extension command to actually get IPy widgets running? I do not. Oh, okay. Um, no. But as I say, you don't need it. Um, so there is an exercise to run some of these and look at what the diagnostics thing is doing. I'm just going to run them and, and, and view it. So if I run length, okay, things go by. Oh, by the way, the things in flight have, um, appear here at the bottom. They uh, came and went quite quickly. Um, so again, each time you run these on this particular set of data, passing the data is the thing that always takes the longest here. But it's all running in parallel, which is really nice. There is more information available here, um, in particular profile. So this is like, I don't know if you used to flame graphs or, or snake viz or any of these tools that are around. This is telling you on a, a statistical basis what the CPU was doing for each of the workers uh, in your cluster, so the, the eight processes here. So this is a very useful way of um, find, it, it's, it's, a, it's not quite a full profiling of your code, but it's, it's actually really nice. So you can select, I happen to know this was my, my latest little batch, the, the length call, and I can look through here at what was going on. So most, mostly I was calling well, this is apply. So that's the thing that's actually saying do some work. And almost everything here is, pa is pandas read text. So it's a pandas function that's taking all of the time up to here, which is just the thing called read. And then there's some extra stuff down here about uh, date conversion, which is some kind of list comprehension over all of the dates that you have in each of your data frames. Um, so passing the data takes the longest, and then converting some of those date times, because um, if we go back here, uh, wherever df was defined, this thing saying that these three columns are going to become a date time, this actually takes a significant amount of time. And now we know that. Before, we wouldn't have known that unless we explicitly wanted to pull this out of Dask and um, benchmark it separately. No, profile it, I should say. So that's quite useful. Now if we, um, if we run another one, this is taking the length of a filtered data set. Go back here. There, I'll do that twice so that we can see it go. You can. See, you actually saw. The, the, I'm sorry. These are going too fast. Dask is too good, obviously. Um, <laughs> uh, you can also get progress bars in here to see the tasks go. If you want, we'll we'll uh, show that in a bit. This one's more complicated, so this should take a little longer. Except that we have the same problem as before. So presumably this does it. Okay, now you see there's lots of tasks. Uh, still loading takes the longest time, but then there's there's lots of these little pieces on the end here. You can, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. You can zoom in on them if you want to. Um, the, you can hover over these, these different tasks to see what they are. So here's the get, getting of items, uh, group by count chunk, and then sum. Uh, so you, you shouldn't be surprised by the kinds of things that are required to make this happen. Uh, and again, these red boxes are communication. If you have a workload where you see a lot of red cropping up, then um, you, you might need to think about if there's a way of doing it with less communication. How did I end up with two? Okay, and the last one, this is going to look quite similar, except now we're doing some date time thing. Did you file one yet? Um. And again, things progress pretty quickly. Basically, the time is dominated by how long it takes to read the biggest of these chunks. Uh, the time it happens to take might not be because it's biggest. It might be just because the, the disk is busy. 
Ah, okay, and here's the... Um, so we'll be coming back to this. This is just the flavor of basically saying that you have this option. In the next section, you'll see that you can run now using the distributed scheduler your jobs on a distributed cluster. It was built for that reason, but it turned out that it was better at most things. So um, use it. It takes, in the simplest case, a single line of extra code to make the distributed scheduler happen. That is that client line. But it comes with lots of options. Options mean complexity, so it can take a little bit of getting used to. But not only is it quite smart and efficient, it also enables a new API, which I will come to after Tom's next section. Um, we will be moving to the cluster. So um, this was the IP. Now Tom will come and start talking, but you should all go to this IP and log in with something, some name that's unique to you. Uh, everybody has access. And hopefully the cluster keeps going. Yeah. Cluster's happy? Uh, for now, yeah. OK. <laughs> yeah. This is running on the cluster currently. So, so. Uh, our worker nodes were auto-scaled down. Uh, everyone should get a Jupyter Hub pod very quickly. OK. Uh, we'll be making Dask workers shortly. There's auto-scaling enabled by Google, so it can take a number of minutes for those workers to appear. Uh, quite a lot of complex stuff is done when that happens. New machines are started, as Kubernetes installed, and then a whole bunch of containers are initiated from some very large image. So a little bit of patience when we get to it. Can you go back to the address? Hmm. Back to the address. You want to use uh, no, I'm just going to have the uh, <laughs> stats over here. See if anyone's pods do not come up. What, was there anything else about schedulers in, in general that people wanted to ask? Yeah. Uh, when you're, uh, so you, when you go to this IP address, you'll get a login box, and then that. When you get past that, you say start my server, and that will drop you into Jupyter Lab, only now running at this IP address. Uh, when you get there, open up the uh, fifth notebook about uh, distributed data frames. Uh, does everyone have the IP? Can I change? Who still needs the IP address? All right, I'm going over. OK, close this. Um, Yes. Do I just close the? All right. All right. Um, just to kick things off, uh, can everyone run these first two cells? Uh, oh, hopefully I ran mine soon enough. I did not run mine soon enough. OK, so uh, so now we're um, here. I'll put this in here in case people need it. Okay. Um, yeah, so now we're on this cluster. And everyone's getting their own Dask cluster uh, isolated from everyone else, in theory. Uh, when you run the cell, we can actually take a look at the code. It's not doing anything special. Uh, Dask works with a ton of different, uh, or many different, resource managers. Uh, in this case, we're on Google Cloud Platform using Google's uh, Kubernetes engine. So this is like a managed Kubernetes service. If you're not familiar with Kubernetes, don't worry about it. It's a thing that takes care of running these applications, these containerized applications. Um, so we are um, interacting with Kube plus Dask Kubernetes here. It provides a Kube cluster object. Um, all of these cluster objects, there's one for like HPC systems, uh, like Yarn or, or sorry, Slurm or um, all the other ones. I don't know them all. Uh, there's ones for Yarn if you're coming from the Hadoop world. Uh, there's other ones. Uh, uh, and like I said, this one's using uh, Kubernetes. Uh, Separate from that, there's uh, like the actual underlying machines that this is this uh, compute is actually happening on. Um, like Martin said, we're on Google Cloud Platform, which does auto scaling. Um, I, I had made a bunch of machines, and then they're just sitting there idle for an hour, and it got auto scaled down. Um, but they're coming back up now, I think. Yeah. Okay. 
So yeah, the machines are coming back up now, and this is like an IPython widget, and so when the machines arrive, you'll see the workers pop in here. Um, once the machines are ready, we're still not quite there yet. We have to get the environment in place. So Kubernetes is based around Docker images. And so uh, once a machine is ready for this uh, Dask worker to show up, it has to download a Docker image. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Docker, but the scientific Python stack is huge in terms of like megabytes. So that also takes quite a bit of time. This is like a collective action problem that we all have to solve, where we need to re reduce the sizes of our libraries so that we can quickly you know, scale up and scale down these clusters. So if you maintain a package that uses like Cython code or something, then uh, think about this. There's a GitHub thread on Cython about how we can solve this problem as a community. Yeah. Is there any way to make a new login? Because it doesn't like underscores. If you let, um, <laughs> yeah, if you go to, uh, oof, um, sorry. Uh, so take that URL and go to slash hub slash home. Uh, and then there's a logouts. And then you can log back in. Mm -hmm. Anyone else having issues? Ah, I have workers. I have four workers. I asked for nine. So they'll come in. Uh, this kind of shows a cool thing about Dask. It's adaptive, where workers can come and go. Uh, sorry, this is Dask distributed. Workers can come and go. And there's actually a mode you can set it to where it'll be looking at your computation and noticing, oh, hey, you're low on memory, or you're, uh, you have a ton of tasks. You don't have enough CPUs. Let me auto scale up quickly, give you some more workers for this large burst of work that you've submitted, and then I'll scale down. Um, it works out quite nicely. But again, you have to download that large Docker image. So. Uh, not as good as it could be. Okay, and then make sure to open this uh, dashboard. Uh, and I'm going to try and do this uh, on this side here. It's going to not work perfectly, but that's okay. I'd recommend whenever you're working with uh, the distributed scheduler to have these open side by side. Okay. Ah, I'm going to make this a bit smaller since you all have it. OK. Um, so the, the rest of my workers will come in. Uh, but I have a cluster uh, with some workers, and then I connect to it uh, by passing that cluster. Uh, who has successfully created a cluster and has some workers? Here. OK. Is anyone having issues? Yeah, this is, this is good. Uh, you're having issues? What sort? No workers. No workers yet, hopefully. I'm going to quickly scan through here. Uh, uh, we have some containers creating. Is there anyone? Um, yeah. Okay. This is good. Yeah. Okay. There are no errors yet, anyway. Uh, if you don't have workers yet, they will show up, I think. Yeah, that's cool. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so. Distributed computing is somewhat complex. Uh, there are things that change when you go from local to distributed computing. Uh, first of all, environments, making sure that your environment exactly matches between all of the machines that are in this cluster is uh, something that you have to worry about. So, uh, one, so with Kubernetes, typically you're going to provide an image for your uh, for your scheduler and your workers, and it's good to have that image be uh, installing the same environment in both places. Um, file systems. So if you're working on a laptop or a large workstation, you, know, you have a file system. Uh, when you're working with multiple machines, they need some way to um, all see the data. So that can be like a network uh, share, or in this case, we'll be working with a cloud storage, uh, Google cloud storage. So all of these workers can talk to that, um, that bucket. Um, and then communication. Uh, it's not such a huge deal on a single machine. Things can be sent between processes pretty quickly. Um, it's, it's slow relative to like copying data. But uh, when you're on a network, uh, sending things between machines, it takes much, much longer. So again, if you have a lot of communication, maybe think about how your workflow can be restructured. OK. Um, so earlier, we worked with a subset of this New York Flights data set. Uh, now we're going to be taking a look at the uh, larger thing. So we have more columns, uh, more years here. And we'll take a look at the first uh, five rows. Again, um, I'm going to adjust this slightly. OK. 
Can't click. There. <laughs> Sorry. And I'm going to make it a bit smaller still. Sorry. Um, OK. So we have these workers here. Whoops. And uh, we're basically going to be doing similar things to what we did before, um, but on a cluster now. So able to scale out to larger data sets. Um, one thing uh, earlier we saw, like to get a concrete result, you call compute. Um, but maybe the data set's so large, so you didn't want to do that. When we were working in that first notebook, we had uh, you know computing like the length of the whole thing, like the length of the subset of non-canceled, and maybe doing some group by. Every time we ran that computation and did the compute, we had to read in the CSV from scratch. Um, with a cluster, sometimes your data set will fit in the cluster's RAM. Okay, so it doesn't fit in any individual workers machine, uh, in, in it, it doesn't fit in any individual machine's RAM, but when you uh, spread the data set across the cluster, it fits in distributed memory. Um, and so that's what we're going to do here with persist. So this is kind of like compute. Uh, it doesn't give you a concrete result, but it gives you a, a much, much simpler result, if that makes sense. It's still going to be a DAS data frame, but it's going to have done all of the steps up to that point. It's like a checkpoint. So uh, how would you, um, I mean, this is a, yeah, we're just going to do it. Uh, DF equal DF dot persist. OK. So a couple things to notice. You'll see, first of all, that this returned immediately. So when IPython's running, you know, when the kernel's doing something, it's you know, busy up here. This ran immediately. But in the background, we have a, a bunch of stuff going on. Uh, I'm going to refresh this. I don't know why. Ah, that's why. So in the background, we're doing all that work. Uh, so this uh, DF had some task graph that involved things like reading CSV, parsing text, uh, streaming, actually, even before that, streaming uh, bytes off the network, reading from Google Cloud Storage. So it's doing all of those in the background. And at this point, we have a, a very simple uh, you know, graph behind this thing. It's, it's really just you have a whole bunch of pandas data frames in memory somewhere on the cluster. And then right here, back at the client, we have this uh, DAS data frame object that knows about all of that. Any questions on that? Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, is there a configuration for setting up the cluster? Um, in this case, we're at uh, Dask Tutorial Infrastructure. This has all of the stuff for setting up this specific cluster, aside from like our keys, our private keys and stuff like that. But uh, in this case, it's a, a Helm chart. So it's, it's pretty simple, really. Uh, we're just saying, I want this version of a Pangeo, which is you know a a Helm chart. Helm's like a Kubernetes thing. Like, this is a rabbit hole of stuff. But uh, you know, for most of these, like with Dask Kubernetes, you have some configuration file where you specify uh, you know, what you want, like the number of machines, things like that. Um, there's uh, one for Yarn as well, where it's similar. <coughs> so depending on your specific one, uh, you'll have different uh, setup. But yeah, that's how we did it for this one. OK. So at this point, uh, things like um, computing the number of non-canceled flights. Again, this is still uh, a DASK, DASK data frame. So this is a lazy result. And then we can go ahead and actually uh, compute it here. And that triggers some computation. So there's like a whole bunch of uh, index. So this is like doing the filtering. Uh, and then there's some counting of chunks. And then some communication of those intermediate results to the final uh, aggregation there. That's sum. Notice that there is no network stuff here. There's no reading stuff from uh, Google Cloud Storage. Um, hmm, I don't know what just happened. Did I? Yeah, yeah. Um, so this, I don't know why a worker was killed. I'm not sure why. Uh, Dask, the Dask scheduler maintains some state of which workers have which data. If a worker disappears, that's fine. Dask is going to recompute the stuff that was lost. So, yeah, that's cool. I guess that that happened. <laughs> I'm not sure why, but it's uh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to rerun this to finish my point. Um, 
is it uh i'm not sure what happened anyway uh there they are but when we were doing this uh this count here there's no reading from google cloud storage there's no parsing of text that's already been persisted which is important when the io takes up a significant amount of your workloads time okay exercise um oops i forgot to comment this out <laughs> okay uh, this uh, probably won't work because of this, or does it? Ah, I don't know. Okay, uh, yeah, so again, it's just pandas like code, uh, and then you know, happening on a cluster. Any questions on that group? I, it's the same as what we did before, but yeah. Is there a way to see um, in the profile tab? Um, yeah. um, is there a way to see just the profile of what we just did? Like, I was, I yeah. Um, so this, uh, along the bottom, there's a little scrubber for the time. So let's uh, rerun this computation. Okay, and I'm gonna refresh this page. And so this is the computation we just did for the group by, and then you can, that filters it down to just that computation. I'm assuming this is the read CSV, the persist, yeah. Okay. All right, so we said earlier that Dask has this, Dask data frame, sorry, has this idea of partitions um, that gives, um, it's important for performance. Um, we're gonna take a look at that. So we have 85 partitions that comes from the 85 original files that we read in, and we do not know the divisions, okay? And so, you know, depending on what you're trying to do, this can have pretty significant performance implications. Uh, depending on like if you're doing indexing lookups on the index or merges and joins, this can have uh, performance implications. So basically what that's saying is that um, these boundaries, so every DAS data frame has these different partitions where you know, it's always gonna be partitioned and each individual partition is a pandas data frame. Uh, but this known divisions is saying, does DAS know like the start and the end point of each partition? And in this case, we don't, because we just read it from CSV. CSVs don't have any kind of uh, partitioning schema that we can look up ahead of time. To get an index with, um, uh, so yeah, we're gonna see a, an, a, an example of uh, how it can affect performance. Okay. We wanna uh, compute the memory usage. How would you do this with pandas? We can do it as a group. Say again? I heard this, memory usage. What's this? What type of object? Panda series, DAS series, scalar number. It's a DASC series. So this is the memory usage per column. We'll sum that up. So this is a DASC scalar. Again, we haven't done anything. And then we'll compute that. And maybe we'll divide by, uh, 29 to get gigs. Oh, so this is a pretty small data set. It's only eight gigs, but anyway. Uh, um, I think so. Uh, maybe we need a deep equal true here to get the strings. 18 gigs, perhaps. Strings are weird. Okay. Yeah. Alrighty. Okay, so now we're gonna see partitioning. <coughs> Uh, so let's take an example. Uh, I want to give all the flights that were on uh, the 5th of May, sorry, uh, you know, all, all the flights on this date. Okay, so how do I do that with pandas? Uh, probably Boolean filtering. It's just some column. Date is some column. It's a string column. Uh, so with pandas, I do it like that. And just kind of like for your mental model, what is Dask doing at this point? Um, it's doing a whole bunch of individual, um, uh, you know, these Boolean comparisons on each of the cluster, uh, on each of the partitions scattered throughout the cluster, right? Uh, so there's a bunch of equalities here. There's a bunch of filtering get items here, uh, and then we collapse that down to a single result back to the the client here. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. So this is kind of expensive. It has to scan the entire data set. Um, Maybe if you're doing this with pandas, you would have date as your index and then use dot loc to look it up. So that's what we're gonna do next. Ah, we'll take a look at the graph to verify that it is indeed expensive. 
this is going to be a, a large graph, but you can see there's a whole bunch of uh, get items, some equality checks here, and then again, another get item. That's the Boolean filtering. And that leads back to, you know, this is all producing this single result. Okay. So with pandas, what does set index do? Takes, yeah, so it creates a new index. It takes a column from the data frame, moves it to the index. Um, that does the same thing for Dask. It does a bit more though. Uh, this is going to be this is like a surprisingly expensive computation in Dask. So we're we're doing all these send, set index calls. This one set index call it's triggering a lot of communication. And what's going on now is we we have these uh, we're basically shuffling data between workers. Um, so set, set index is uh, sorting the index and computing the divisions of, uh, so basically the start and end points of each of these uh, partitions. We're going to end up with the same number of partitions, 85. We are going to know the divisions, and I'll wait for this to finish. I'm a little concerned about our memory usage here, but hopefully things work out well. Okay, so we have uh, finished that set index, and now we know the start and end point of each of these partitions. And so now, with, uh, we'll take a look at df.head here. Now that we have our dates in the index, we can um, look up these flights, again, by using loc. And now notice how quick it was this time. So 58 milliseconds versus the uh, one, one and a half seconds from the Boolean filtering. I'm going to collapse this. Does so everyone see the difference there? Uh, make this smaller. If we look at the graph here, we'll see that it's quite a bit simpler, like a lot simpler. This is comparing with the one that was you know, scanning the entire data set, doing all of these equality checks, all these Boolean filterings, producing a, a DAS series that we eventually computed. Now we know exactly, we know that all of the flights for this date are in some partition. I'm not sure which one, but DAS knows which one it's in. So it can skip directly to that partition, say, hey, give, do this operation on your partition, completely ignoring the rest of the data, because we know there's none, uh, there's no flights on this date in any other partition. So that's like a, an important uh, performance consideration to have when you're working with DAS data frame. OK, um, I think we'll, uh, we'll do this operation quick just to show you know, DAS data frame implements a lot of the Pandas API. So something like resampling, um, again, you have a date time index. Uh, so we're going to resample to one month here uh, and then take the average, so the monthly average of the departure delay. Um, this is you know, a cool operation. You can see some communication between uh, workers as we get to the end of one, um, you know, one partition. Uh, the month may spread part uh, span multiple partitions, right? So there's got to be some communication between partitions there. Uh, but DAS takes care of it for you. So you get to write this pandas code uh, and then compute it here before plotting. Cool. Um, okay, so at this point, if you're done with the error, so yeah, we, we have some time to let you play with the cluster just because it's fun, I think. So uh, we've got the flights data set, which you can do a bit more exploration with. Uh, we have the, uh, uh, this taxi New York City taxi cab data set. Um, I would recommend not having them both in memory at once just because their cluster is a bit small. So if you restart the cluster, that'll um, delete the, uh, the airlines data set. Um, you might be able to uh, Dell DF as well. I'm not sure. Um, depends on if there are any other references to it. Um, but yeah, uh, take like, uh, what time is it? Um, what, five minutes or so to play around with the cluster. Uh, and then we'll talk a bit about the advanced uh, distributed scheduler API. So yeah, five minutes. If you have questions, I'll come around. Yeah. Um, so typically, uh, if you're all done with it, you can delete it. And in theory, this will collect some. Uh, there may be other references to it somewhere. So it follows the usual Python rules is if 
if it will get garbage collected, Dask will garbage collect it. There are probably other ways, but. Uh, did we? So, yes. Um, so this is a, when to persist is a good thing to think about. In this case, uh, set index was quite expensive, right? It did all of uh, this communication earlier. Uh, I've lost it, but it did a whole bunch of communication, uh, a whole bunch of computation. Uh, so that's probably a good point to persist it at. If you hadn't persisted, you'd still have the data in RAM, uh, but this operation here would have taken quite a while because doing, um, so if you think about the chain, you have DF from before, the first persist that's in RAM, uh, distributed memory, uh, and then this DF equal DF.set index without the persist, uh, and then when you do DF.loc here, that's kind of doing the chain of set index date, which is expensive, followed by dot loc, which is very quick. Right. Uh, you would not have lost it. It would be, um, uh, so DF, if you do anything to DF, it's still on the set index. Um, so it would be the different index. But each time you do an operation on it, it'll have to redo the set index, which is expensive. So it's just like with reading it from disk. Uh, if you don't persist it, then you re have to redo it later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which shows uh, the flame chart. Mm -hmm. uh, does it introduce any overhead in this um, Maybe a bit. Uh, not much. It's 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 just uh, a separate thread that runs occasionally uh, to see what the workers are currently doing. Um, so it's you know relative to like the cost of communication, uh, you know, sending data. It's it's not going to be real over. It. I I doubt. I mean, you could try it, but I doubt it. it maybe it depends on your computation, but I doubt it. Um, it's, it shouldn't have any effect, any noticeable slowdown. But it, 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 this uh, proponent is made by Dask itself. Right. Uh, well, yeah. So it's a, a separate thread that's monitoring uh, what the worker thread is doing. Thank worker you. threads. Yeah. Okay. So playing with the taxi cab data set here. Uh, this is slightly concerning. So. Dask will spill to disk if needed, um, if the data set's too large for your cluster. Um, so it looks like, uh, you know, ideally I would have a few more workers here to analyze this data set. Um, I'm not even sure if this computation will complete or not, or if it will run out of RAM. Um, but, you know, Dask has, um, you can track those events, and then uh, at that point you might want to turn to like Kubernetes or whatever resource manager is actually killing your workers to figure out what's going on there. Um, but I think we're going to complete. Uh, grouping by the uh, sitting in taxi cab, filtering down to ones where the they actually tipped. Uh, grouping by the hour of the day, uh, which is just an integer, uh, and then take, finding the average tip amount. Um, which, uh, yeah, there's a couple peaks here maybe. 4 a.m. is a nice time to be a driver, I guess. Um, so I think, uh, unless there are any objections, people are, of course, welcome to keep uh, playing with the cluster. Uh, otherwise, I think we'll go on to the uh, next notebook. Um, if you could, just to be kind, uh, go ahead and close the clients um, and close the cluster as well. This will free up your uh, workers for the next notebook. So uh, when we get to this notebook, which I'm going to do quick for Martin so that he has a cluster you should get your workers much more quickly this time because the machines are around and they're free since we just closed them. So uh, yeah, I'll turn it back over to Martin. When you, when you do that plant reset, uh, if your workers- On your laptop. Um, actually, it doesn't need too many resources. It's not really the point of it, but uh, yeah, I think it should be okay. Uh, interestingly, before we go on to it, I don't know if anybody, so we had the peak, sorry, that's not the right one. Oh yeah, so the peak at four o'clock happens to be when the bars close in New York. I, I don't know if people knew that, there is a reason for that to be there. Uh, this one is people going to the bar, maybe, I don't know. Because <laughs> that's all that happens in New York, right? Okay. 
Well, were there any other problems with what we were doing before moving on? We're, uh, uh, it's been quite a long session. We're getting towards the end of it, don't worry. If this is hazy now, maybe it'll ring some bells when you come back to it later. It's the best we can hope. <laughs> okay. Um, so now, again, oh. We restarted a cluster with uh, default nine workers again, and it came back up quite nicely because we just released a load. Um, so when we, th this thing, what shows up here, the details of the cluster and this view of the cluster with its controls are, are not that different. If you're not going to be um, changing your cluster, it's fine. If you're just using a local cluster, you don't usually bother with this. Okay, so uh, coming back to some stuff that looks quite familiar from ages ago when we did delayed things. Okay, here we have increment, now decrement, also an add. And these um, have some sleep statements in them. So there is an alternative API for getting work done by Dask, which is not delayed. Delayed is really good, and it does loads of stuff, but it's not necessarily the solution to whatever you're doing. Also, we have the uh, submit map API. So this may be familiar to people who are used to using concurrent futures. It's something that crops up in lots of other places too, uh, general map reduce type algorithms. Um, but the main point of it is not that. The main point of it is that everything that happens in this notebook happens dynamically. That is, instead of creating a body of work that we want to pass to the uh, ex for execution with Dask. Instead, we're going to execute stuff and check on the results in real time. So to see this happen, I'm going to use this C as the client, and I'm going to use submit. I pass to it the function and some arguments. In this case, there's only a single argument. And you see something happened over here. It ran, kind of slowly. Um, you notice that here, we got back immediately this thing called a future. It's called ink, and its status is pending, and it has some kind of identity. If I check on that future again, now it says it's finished, and it has an integer type, which is cool, because, oh, it was waiting because, of course, there's a steep, so it was it was there for five seconds, waiting for that to happen. And now, after five seconds, we have this thing, foot, which is a future, and it points at a result that happens to be an integer that is being stored somewhere on the cluster for me. Um, had it not already finished, I could have waited for it to finish, which would be typical in some places where I say, this future comes back immediately, and it's working. Sometimes you want to wait for work to finish. And sometimes you want to get the result back. Or get the result back. These two are uh, do the same thing. This one gets, this is similar to how uh, compute works. Dot result gets the result of a particular future. Or we can use gather with any number of futures to wait for all of them to finish and get all of their results. So, so far, none of this is any different from what we were doing with delayed. And you're used to this, so we could have done this delayed of the increment, decrement, the add together. Um, we saw this before. The difference is that we are now passing client.compute here. So before we were just dask.compute or even total.compute was what we, what we were using. But now we're using client.compute. This is passing the same graph to the scheduler again. But now, instead of getting the com concrete result, we get this future. Again, this came back immediately with state pending because it hadn't finished yet. Now it has finished. I can get the result back. So this adds an extra step. You might think, what's the point? The only thing that really this has enabled is that whilst the cluster is working, whilst the, there is work to be done, the notebook here is free to do more stuff, submit more work, potentially. We can also keep checking on the result. Again, this status in the meantime changed. 
from pending to finished, we could keep polling that result and only submit work when the previous res result is ready. So that gives you a hint of how this can be a, a real-time system now. We can submit work at any time. The cluster will go away and work on it. Our system is free to submit more work whenever you like. You can keep checking on results, and so you can build up a, a, a dynamic real-time system. Um, this still used delayed, so the there was only one block of work that was being handed to the cluster to, to do here. But we could have used submit instead. So the, the two are somewhat analogous. Uh, this says build me a graph which contains this functionality. In, if instead we use submit, that's going to say take this function and start working on it on the cluster. So the first exercise is to do exactly the same thing except using submit instead. Um, if this all seems a bit weird, it might take you a little while in experimentation to make this work. Uh, again, the output of this is not any different, so we haven't really made a, a, a huge stride into the future yet, but you'll see in a moment why this is useful. As usual, any questions? I'm sure everybody is wishing for their lunch and to be out of this room, but we're nearly there. Yes? You said gather like, is similar to wait, like it will wait first. How much is it going to ping the processes to the wages? Uh, the communication overhead, talking to and from the scheduler is very low. So it's not going to task the cluster just because you happen to be waiting. It's, in fact, doing that in the background anyway. That's how the future status gets updated. So that happens. While you're typing away at this, I do want to comment on the previous notebook. I don't know if people were impressed that you can put your several or 20 gigabytes, I think it was, for, for the biggest data set. You can put that on your cluster, modest cluster, and you can do operations against it exactly as if it was pandas, and you get a result back in a few hundred milliseconds. I think that's quite impressive. <laughs> it impressed me when I first saw it. <laughs> This notebook is fairly short, so we can take our time over discussing the implications. Uh, many of you will not use this API, but I think it can be something useful to bear in mind. If all you ever use is client.compute, then that's already useful. So I will show you the solution. Are people still working? Anybody still working on this? Anybody still awake? So some of you, some of you. OK, so basically all that happens to run exactly the same work, but using submit instead of delayed, is that we use the client.submit in the place of where the delayed things were. Submit is similarly smart in the way that delayed is smart. When we do submit here, and the inputs to it are futures, because of the previous submit calls, then Dask knows this. And it won't evaluate them here. It will go to the cluster, and it will take this task, this add, and it will put it wherever x or y is. If they're in the same place, then it will go there. So Dask cares about moving the computation to the data, not the other way around. And then again, instead of compute, we're using this gather to get the result back. But otherwise, this is going to look the same. So we had sleeping because we had sleeps in the functions. Okay. 
The only other difference is that this total is held in memory. So anything that's a future that we've used with submit, this is going to be data that's held in memory on the cluster. So I can keep gathering this. It's always there until I get rid of total. So total is the pointer. And once it gets garbage co collected, then the result, which in this case is a small integer, so we don't care, it would not be removed from memory until total is. Okay, so um, we can use this API. Uh, submit is the one function. The other function that you need to know about is map. And this does what you might expect. It takes each of a set of inputs. Oh, sorry, this is, this is bag. Um, we didn't touch on bag, actually, at all. Um, if you're interested, yes? Sorry, question about previous task. Uh, I ran my implementation and then tried to run your implementation. And uh, I see that uh, there was no computation the second time. How to uh, force it to recalculate? Um, if you already have a future that's pointing to a result, there is a unique key involved yeah. that is a hash of all of the inputs of that. So uh, yeah, if, that, if the result exists, then Dask will just get you the result without recomputing it. You would have to delete the result using Dell uh, and, and all references to it until the cluster has forgotten about it, if you wanted to. Um, yeah, I'm not going to talk about bag. Bag is something that you can look up yourself. We used to have a, a bag section to this tutorial, but people don't use it that often. It's a functional programming paradigm. So uh, some of you maybe use that. Um, the point of it is that wherever you had a, um, a collection, so this could be array or data frame, or in this case, bag, you can use those with a client.compute just as well, uh, just the same as you could have used a delayed thing like we had before. Basically, everything works. And an, an added little feature is that you can watch these things progress in here. This output on here is part of this output here. Sometimes it's useful to see all the different parts. Basically, there are quite a few uh, bells and whistles built around the distributed scheduler that will be useful to you. And then again, we can get the, the result back. So here is the Dell. And this should get rid of uh, some data on the cluster. It's uh, Unfortunately, in Python, it's easy to have references of things around. For example, I just deleted f, but especially when I'm running in the notebook, output 17 is that very same thing. Now output 22 is also that same thing. So you would have to delete all of them or m more realistically run these things within a function, because when functions end, then the things that they were working on get uh, garbage collected. So uh, a, a little bit of, of care is useful. In a case like this, where I'm trying to demonstrate you know, what everything looks like, then it's not really tractable to actually get rid of anything. Fortunately, none of these things actually take up any memory. So don't worry about it for now. Um, there is only one last piece of this uh, notebook. And this is an actual asynchronous computation. And again, it's physics-y because this is SciPy. You're supposed to like this kind of thing. Uh, this is an optimization problem and a really stupidly simple way of finding the minimum of this function, which is called Rosenbrock. Even this function is too fast. So there's a, another sleep in here just to make sure that this does take some time. In fact, I'll put this up a little. And a certain amount of uh, boilerplate that you don't need to worry about. This is making some input. So that we'll have a, an array, x and y grid, to evaluate this thing on. Um, and the output. Uh, the, the reason is so that we can visualize it. None of this has anything to do with the computation itself. The computation is here, and it's kind of long. And it looks a little bit complicated, but you don't need to worry about most of this. Most of this is um, what we're going to be doing is to evaluate the minimum of this function. We're going to choose random numbers. 
and evaluate the function and see if the output is smaller than the best lowest value that we've had so far. It's a very simple way, brute force way to try and minimize a function. So what we do is we pick a point and we pick some, some start scale around it. So uh, uniform is going to make us some points, some random points between Scale is just a, a search box size. So we're going to pick 10 points in the vicinity of 0, 0. 0, 0 is not the minimum. And then we're going to submit each of these as inputs to Rosenbrock function to be evaluated on the cluster. We're going to use this new magic that we haven't seen so far, which is also imp imported from DAS distributed called as completed. And we're going to use this to view the results as they become available. Each time a result is available, we are going to investigate its result. We're going to see, is this point better than the best point we've had so far? If so, we're going to update the best score and the best point so far. Also, each time a result becomes available, we're going to submit, well, we're going to make a new point again, randomly distributed, and we're going to submit it to the cluster also to be evaluated. So we're always going to have 10 points in flight at any given time. And as they come back, we're going to, each time one comes back, we'll submit a new one until uh, we are close enough to our best, smallest value of the function. Other stuff in here, there is plotting. So this is to do with bokeh plotting. Uh, this is to do with bokeh plotting. Don't worry about it. This is just going to show up on here and ho hopefully show up fairly nicely. Um, the reason for using bokeh is that you can dynamically update the plot. So now you can actually not only dynamically run your computation as the results come in, you can also visualize the output as it gets completed. So let's make it go. You can see here are the points, and they are converging towards this value. You also see this bar never gets completed. There are always more, more points to be evaluated until we reach a stopping criterion. And you can see, basically, we've already found the best point here. And there we go. Now we've stopped. Now we're, we're right down here. And the best value at the end of all of this is 1, 1-ish. And these were the best values as, well, these are the function values and the point at which they were evaluated as we were going on each time we had a, a better point. So we didn't actually get that many better points as we went through a handful of times. But we did still manage to converge down to this spot. This is just a logarithmic version 2D view of the same thing that is plotted here. This is the MATLAB view. This is the Bokeh view. This is probably more informative. <laughs> um, many function evaluations. So this is not any way or shape an efficient way of finding the minimum of this function, but it's a, a nice little example. Um, I'm going to, this is the last thing that I'm going to show. We're going to wrap up here. So if you have any comments or questions about this piece, then we'll have those first, and then we'll, we'll uh, leave you with a few words. We do machine learning if people want it. We have the notebook. We have the notebook. It runs. Do people, are you, people interested in machine learning? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah we can run it. I think it, it mostly works. It's a little out of date, so apologies. But uh, uh, yeah, questions on this first, though. I'll, I'll take this moment to remind you that there will be the Birds of Feather session and the sprints for those that are interested. Um, Dask is going to crop up mentioned in a few of the talks that are happening as well. Um, do you know when those are? Mm -hmm. oh, okay, so check your calendars. <laughs> there's, a, there's a talk on Dask ML Friday morning by Olivier Grisel. That's the only one I know of. Oh, cool, go ahead. Yeah. Jim Chris is also giving a talk on debugging Dask. Matt Ra Rockland's giving a talk on advanced Dask techniques. Um, yeah, there's a few others. Um, Dask is also, so it's not just like Dask, the library and Dask data frame, 
those sorts of things. Uh, libraries like X-Ray, um, people may have used, uh, uses Dask internally to parallelize their and make their computations run out of core. Um, Scikit Image is giving a tutorial in this room later. Uh, has some new stuff for doing par applying functions in parallel using Dask. Okay. Um, I'm gonna. Oh yeah. Uh, before you move on, whoops. Uh, you can close down your cluster. Uh, sorry. Yeah. From the previous notebook. Just to free up those workers. Um, uh, I think it was closed. Okay, machine learning. So uh, there's this library called DaskML that uh, we've been working on, trying to see what a you know large, uh, what what Scikit-Learn on a cluster looks like, basically. Um, so that's what we've been playing around with, uh, and this notebook goes through a bit of that. Uh, up front, there's two types of scaling problems that you might run into when you're working with scikit-learn. So, you know, scikit-learn is basically down here where the data set fits in RAM, uh, the model isn't too big by like large models, I'm thinking like really large ensembles. So uh, random forest with a whole bunch of estimators or a grid search over a ton of different parameters, things like that. That's a large model in my mind. Um, scikit-learn works really well for things that aren't too big along either of those dimensions. Um, once you start getting into very, very large models, so big grid searches, randomized searches, um, then you might want to, you're happy with scikit-learn, you just want to distribute the work across more workers. So that's what we'll see first. And then uh, when your data sets are larger than RAM, um, you know, things like NumPy start breaking down. So in that case, we kind of have to think more about, okay, what's it mean for an estimator to take a Dask array that's larger than memory, and what can we do with that? All right, uh, people, who here is familiar, uh, who here is familiar with scikit-learn already? Okay, um, if not, there's a tutorial tomorrow, a full day tutorial. Oh, I guess you have to sign up for tutorial, so uh, maybe you signed up for it. Um, it has a pretty, um, you know, like a, a simple, a small API, I guess, uh, for how you uh, fit models. So the idea is that you have some data, typically NumPy arrays, um, and you have an X in this case. We're just going to make random data here. So we have an X and a Y. Uh, these are uh, small data sets, data sets. So X that shape is just uh, 10,000 by four. So it's a small data set. Um, we're talking first about this area here where you're with a small data set, but a large model. Okay, and we want to fit a uh, support vector class classifier, sorry, not a linear regression. Okay, um, with scikit-learn, the basic idea is you specify the estimator ahead of time. Uh, it has some hyperparameters that control the fitting. Uh, and then you, when you're ready to actually train it, you do estimator.fit with the X and the Y. All right. So that's scikit-learn, and then uh, it learns some stuff like the support vectors of the SVC. And you can check the score, things like that. So uh, we're not really talking about scikit-learn, but that's the basic idea is you specify an estimator, maybe with some hyperparameters, and then call fit with some data. Okay. Um, so estimators have hyperparameters that affect the quality of fit. Uh, these are specified before training, so they affect the fit, but they're not actually being learned during the training. Um, so in this case, we've set the C here, which is some parameter for SVC, uh, controlling the regularization, I think, and it's made our score much, much worse since we set it way too small. So it affects the fit, but it's not actively learned during training. One way to find good hyperparameters is with uh, grid search. So this is gonna, basically going to try out a whole bunch of uh, different hyperparameter combinations and then pick the one that does best. So again, uh, grid search CV is a way of doing that. Uh, you specify a grid of parameters or you know, uh, uh, a list of parameters that you want to try out for each hyperparameter and then fit it again just with the X and the Y. Okay, so that's scikit-learn, sorry, if you're already familiar with it. Um, this is gonna take a little bit longer because it's trying out all four of these combinations. It's doing some cross-validation that we're not gonna talk about, but it ends up with fitting eight different models and then telling us which one was the best. Okay, all right, so scikit-learn. Um, scikit-learn, if you've used it before, you've probably seen this in jobs uh, keyword here. 
Uh, this controls how uh, things are fit in parallel. So if you think about this grid search, right, there's, uh, we're fitting you know, four different combinations of parameters and two CV splits of each of those. So there's eight models fit in total, and those can be fit completely independent of each other. Uh, we can fit all eight models. In theory, we could fit all eight models at once and then just pick the one that has the best score. Um, Scikit-learn does really well at that for a single machine. Okay, so you say I want n jobs equals minus one, and this will take you know it's not quite times eight it's not quite eight times as fast, but it's faster. Um, I don't know if I timed the whole thing. Oh, I think I did. Yeah, it's refitting the final model here. Anyway, it took um, some time before, so 32 seconds, and this time it took 15 seconds, so about twice as fast. All right, that is single machine parallelism uh, with scikit-learn, which works well for data sets that fit in RAM and models that aren't too big. What if you have a much larger model? Um, so again, we'll connect to our cluster here. Hopefully I get some workers. I should have done, done this earlier. Okay, I got my workers. Connect to the cluster. I'm gonna open up the UI. Okay, and now I have a bigger cluster. I'm actually, this is taking too long, uh, so I'm gonna cheat. Um, you could get a bigger cluster, or I'm just gonna make a smaller grid here. Um, so, so now, instead of like a eight uh, combinations, we're gonna have uh, 90 different ones. Um, and the only thing, like the API is the same. You're still gonna specify your estimator, uh, and you're still gonna uh, call you know, estimator.fit with the X and the Y. The only thing that changes is that we're gonna do this inside of this parallel backend context manager. So I kind of skipped over it, but scikit-learn internally uses joblib to parallelize things on a single machine. And there's a way for projects to say, hey, uh, I can also do stuff in parallel. Uh, we, Dask has done that work to talk to Joblib to say, hey, uh, I know how to run your, your task in parallel so that when scikit-learn reaches this section of code that can be run in parallel, uh, it reaches, it checks the context and says, okay, what backend am I under? It's gonna be under Dask uh, backend, and so your stuff will happen on the cluster, basically. So what this means is with this change to your code by just changing this, um, grid search.fit to run inside of this parallel backend, your computations happens on a cluster instead of a single machine. So pause for, yeah, that's, that's nice, I think. Um, so that's good work by the scikit-learn team to make this pluggable. Um, the slight thing that matters there is we have the scatter argument. Um, I think in the next version of scikit-learn, um, uh, this won't be as important. So. Um, Briefly, what's happening is uh, this is a DAS thing to say, hey, the data set fits in each of my workers' RAM. So remember, we have a small data set here. So go ahead and send that data out to all of the workers once. Every worker has a copy of the data. And so then when they say, hey, I need this subset of the data for the CV split, uh, it's already local. If you didn't have it, you would get to that point where you say, okay, I need this subset of the data for the CV split. It would have to go back to the scheduler and say, okay, where's this data at? And then we would send it. So there's extra communication there that you avoid by scattering it ahead of time. All right, any questions on that? Okay, cool. Thoughts? Comments, yeah? Okay. So. The key thing with this is it only works for data sets that fit in RAM. We're still using scikit-learn to do the training. Uh, and yeah, so, so that just works for, scikit-learn only works on in-memory data sets, basically. So what do you do when you have a larger data set? Um, we're gonna generate some data here. Uh, like I said, I didn't think we would get to this notebook, so I didn't update it. Um, but uh, this stuff, it's, it's, it's using DAS delayed to do a bunch of uh, um, generating some random data. We can also do um, daskml.datasets and do daskml.datasets.make blobs. Um, similar sort of thing. It would do the same thing with uh, one line of code, but oh well. So we have 16 gigs of data on the cluster. Um, each of our workers has, I think, four gigs of data, maybe. Um, so it's, the data set is larger than any of our individual workers' RAM. So we're definitely like in an out-of-core distributed uh, regime here. So 
DaskML re-implements some things from scratch. Um, there's uh, things like from DaskML dot preprocessing, um, you know, ordinal encoder, robust scaler, standard scaler, these sorts of things um, work quite well. There's um, like decomposition, there's like PCA, truncated SVD. Um, so there's, we've done some things, we've done k-means. Um, this is, you know, it's a lot more work to re-implement an estimator basically. Um, so, uh, but yeah, it's a uh, k-means, it's going to run on the cluster here and you'll sign to see there's some like initialization stuff that's happening where we're picking a set of initial clusters here. Um, and then there's going to be some, your basic k-means algorithm where you're doing the, the points, you know, of the current set of clusters, uh, uh, find the closest point, the closest cluster center to each point, and then uh, updating the cluster, so that usual k-means algorithm. It's gonna be happening on the cluster. Um, I'm not sure what happened here. Do I still have a kernel? I think I still have a kernel. So that's happening in the background, um, and it'll finish. I'm not sure how long it takes, but it'll finish eventually. Um, yeah, so I guess at this point, um, I'd be curious in talking to people. So this is all at uh, Dask ML. Uh, it's all at DaskML, so if you're interested in doing you know, scalable machine learning, uh, I'd encourage you to check it out, uh, file issues if you run into any issues. Uh, it's a younger project, so we're, we're putting it together, but yeah. Any questions or? We have a, uh, an issue for roadmap. So, if you want to define that uh, uh, roadmap, we have some things uh, on this uh, issue here. So, um, yeah, this is a, a, a very uh, scattered version right now. But yeah, if you want to help define the roadmap, please comment there. Uh, we'd, we're interested. So, any other questions? Um, general questions? Um, yeah. Um, cool, so Martin and I will be around all week. If you have uh, feedback on the tutorial, especially critical feedback, we would greatly appreciate that. So um, yeah, otherwise, thanks uh, for joining us and I'll see you around.